morning, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you all to the first research conference of Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna, RCFMJ 2022. Organized by the Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna, under the spare of the Jaffna University International Research Conference 2022. On the theme of shaping medical sciences in a new normal. The conference is being carried out as a three-day event. We successfully completed a pre-conference workshop on the 4th of August under the theme, Challenges in Common Neglected Tropical Diseases in the Northern Province and the Way Forward by experts in the relevant field. Also, a free paper session was held yesterday where 33 research papers were presented. Today's conference will be presented through three symposia including burden of non-communicable diseases, ongoing research activities and future directions, regional issues on maternal and child health and their future directions, and future health development and directions for the faculty to consider. It's a great pleasure to welcome our chief guest, WHO representative, country representative for Sri Lanka, Dr. Alaka Singh, who joined us today through the virtual platform to RCFMJ 2022. A very warm welcome to our Vice Chancellor, Professor S. Sri Satpunaraja, and a very kind welcome to our former Vice Chancellor, Council members, and deans of other faculties. Also, we would like to render a very special welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Rifat Atul from the Department of Global Health Systems, Harvard University, United States, who has joined us today through a virtual platform. Also, we wish to render a very warm welcome to all the distinguished guests and delegates who joined us from all parts of the island and all parts of the world. Finally, a very warm welcome to all who gather here in the auditorium and through the virtual platforms. We wish to have a fruitful conference today. Ladies and gentlemen, let's rise for the national anthem.
knowledge, wisdom, and learning. To start this wonderful conference with the lighting of the oil lamp, and to do the honors, may I invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor S. C. Satkunaraja, to light the oil lamp. He will be followed by our Dean, Faculty of Medicine, and Chairperson, RCFM J2022, Professor Srendra Kumar. He will be followed by Dr. A. K. D. Swaran, Provincial Director of Health Services, Northern Province. kindly invite our former Vice Chancellor and Senior Professor of Biochemistry, Head Department of Biochemistry, Faculty of Medicine, Commission Member of University of Grand Commission, Professor Basandi Arasaratna. Also, we invite our former Vice Chancellor, present Council Member and our Emeritus Professor, Professor Balasundaram Pillai. Kindly invite our former Vice Chancellor and Senior Professor of Biochemistry, Head Department of Biochemistry, Faculty of Medicine, Commission Member of University Grant Commission, Professor Basandi Arsaradna. He will be followed by S. Kandarasan, sir, Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies. He will be followed by Professor V. Ravirajan, Dean, Faculty of Science. We kindly invite former Vice Chancellor, Professor N. Sanmugali. invite Dr. Mrs. S. Sri Murali Dharan, Dean, Faculty of Hindu Studies. He will be followed by the Bursar University of Jaffna, Mr. K. Suresh Kumar. Secretary RCFMJ, Dr. M. Surya Kumaran, to light the oil lamp.
our Dean, Faculty of Medicine, and the Chairperson of RCFMJ 2022, Professor R. Surendra Kumaran, and the Secretary, RCFMJ 2022, Dr. M. Surya Kumaran. Thank you. May I invite Professor R. Surendra Kumaran, our Dean Faculty of Medicine, and the Chairperson, RCFMJ 2022, to address the gathering. Good morning. Um, welcome. Our Chief Guest. Dr. Alakasi, country representative, World Health Organization. Professor S. Sri Sakunaraja, the Vice Chancellor, University of Arsenal. Uh, former Vice Chancellors, Deans of the Faculties, Conference Speakers, Professors, Lecturers, Participants, and Students. As Dean and Conference Chair, on behalf of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Arsenal, I am delighted to welcome all the research conference of the Faculty of Medicine. Today, the world is fast changing and the borders between countries are becoming more and more blurred. So the problem occurring in society are more complex than those that exist in the past. So in order to solve these problems, we need a multidisciplinary approach on a global scale. So this is clearly apparent in the collaboration that is already taking place among academic and research institutions in the country worldwide and also evident in this conference. So one of the main collaborators with us is the Ministry of Health. And we have here Provincial Director of Health Service, Dr. Kedi Swaran. He is always work with us and also the Director of Teaching Hospital Jaffna couldn't attend today uh, because of his uh, and the commitment. So all our, our partners with this international collaboration, which made us to progress uh, immense, that we are going to showcase some of the things today. And also this conference is going to discuss our future directions and how we are going to embark on. So RCFMJ seeks further our goal of transforming the Faculty of Medicine Jaffna in the face of dynamic and disruptive challenges took its strategic position as a center of knowledge development in medicine among leading institutions in the world. As per the faculty's strategic plan, we hope to achieve this by producing research-based knowledge, establishing a flipped learning environment, modernizing academic services, and enhancing the performance of both management and operations. So conference brings together the faculty, other stakeholders, and international partners to reflect on our achievements and challenges. The RCFMJ 2022 theme, Shaping Medical Science in the New Normal, is expected to guide ongoing and new research initiatives to develop the health of people and healthcare service, including interrelated issues in the region and the support of the global community. To this end, our faculty is as a strong in traditional approaches as they are in adapting innovative practices to confront emerging regional and global issues. So in this uh, context, the conference is organized in three days. We had a very successful free conference session, which was fully sponsored by Fairmed in Tine Hotel for the medical officers working in the region on challenges in common neglected tropical diseases in the northern province of Sri Lanka and the way forward. 
experts from the national and regional level at the interactive sessions and the outcomes will be considered in future health service development and research. So there was a free paper session which was held on 5th August 2022 yesterday. So there were two parallel sessions and then we received total number of abstracts 59 after several rounds of review, the 38 abstracts were accepted, but uh, 33 were presented. There were 22 oral presentation and 16 uh, poster presentations. The papers were evaluated and the three best oral presentation and one poster presentation will be awarded. The details of the selected presentations will be announced during the closing session. Today the conference starts with formal inauguration session. We got a WHO country representative, Dr. Alaka Singh, as a chief guest. It's a great strength for us to embark many activities which could be relevant to the region and the national level. Already the faculty is uh, coordinating the Jaffna Healthy City project which is uh, technically guided by the WHO Sri Lanka that is also considered as a kind of a landmark project of this region. So we got eminent speaker, Prof. Rifat Atun, uh, as a keynote speaker uh, from Harvard University. He is a global health and uh, uh, health, um, health system advisor for the several countries in the global. So his talk will be on building resilient health system. It's a very appropriate for the conference and the post-COVID pandemic world, which is facing many challenges in many fronts, including in health. We also started to work with Prof. Aton uh, for strengthening health system in Northern province. So there are uh, post-conference discussions related to this. So. Uh, this relationship, but what we have built through this conference uh, will be useful for the future activity. And there are three symposiums. We got these, uh, our local presenters and uh, uh, international presenters uh, to focus in uh, three relevant fields of the uh, health issues what we are facing in the region. The burden of non, the symposium one is uh, handling the burden of non-communicable diseases, ongoing research activities and future directions, innovation and strategies during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we got this uh, uh, Prof. Darren is from uh, SingHealth. He's going to talk about innovation and strategies during the COVID-19 pand pandemic, what worked for Singaporean uh, health care orthopedics. So he is a senior consultant orthopedic surgeon, Singapore General Hospital. Then Dr. Guru Baran, our senior consultant cardiologist, teaching hospital Jaffna, is delivering talk, is atherosclerosis inevitable? Can we stop or delay or reverse it? Then we got uh, Dr. N. Vigneswaran, Senior Consultant with Department Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Singapore Health Hospital, Dr. N. Vignes. He is uh, presenting uh, about this endoscopic treatment of GI cancers. We already started uh, research collaborative work with this uh, Dr. Vignes to screen uh, this uh, uh, endoscopy patients coming to teaching hospital Jaff Jaffna uh, for the early detection of esophageal cancer. And then our symposium two is covering regional issues on maternal and child health, the future directions. So we got uh, uh, Professor Epidemiology, uh, Professor Debbie Lower. So she is also investigator and British Heart Foundation and chair Bristol Medical School. Uh, she is talking about harnessing the power of global-wide birth cohorts. Then we have our 
local expert, uh, Professor Gita Angeli Satyadas, Professor of Pediatrics, Faculty of, Faculty of Medicine, Unis Jaffna. She is delivering one of the important problems that affects of digital media on children's health. Then we have our young, growing uh, faculty, uh, Dr. S. Raghraman, senior lecturer, consultant, obstetrician, talking about management of subfield fertility couples in Sri Lanka. So we have a symposium three that is going to talk about our future health development and directions for the faculty to consider. We got this Professor Krishnandra Kumar, Professor in Health Data Science, and Public Health, Honorary Consultant in Public Health Medicine, Deputy Director of Applied Health Research, University of Birmingham. He is talking about Dexter, an automated epidemiology platform for electronic health record research. And then we got this uh, another uh, speaker from our neighboring country, India, the Professor Anandi Ramachandran, Associate Professor Health IT, International Institute of Health Management Research, Delhi. The final uh, speaker we got, the professor and senior consultant, Department of Obstetrics Gynecology, National University Hospital, Singapore, and the Dean, Jung Lu Ling School of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Professor Chong Yap Singh, is delivering the talk on health management, enrich the human resource capacity, then, the finally, we are going to have a closing session with that uh, uh, remarks from two eminent academics. One is Professor Sir Ravrak Kumaran, and also our uh, local formal vice chancellor and the commission member and Professor senior professor of biochemistry, Professor Vasandhyar Saratnam. So we are excited and are honored to have this opportunity to work with our co-host, Fairmet, Singhel, Global AF, Jaffna Health City, IHMR, and discussion chairs, moderators, to achieve objectives of this uh, conference. I hope that this international multidisciplinary conference will provide our participants with a truly transformative experience and provide a platform for new knowledge and perspectives that will contribute towards tackling our society's complex health problems. I am welcoming all to and enjoy this whole day with us through this uh, uh, Zoom and also physically. You are welcome and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. A leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Ladies and gentlemen, let me invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor S. Sri Satkunaraja, to address the gathering. Anandamai in Narivai Narenda Amudamai Vanan the Mana Vadudial Marainan Yenukum Tanan the Mana Saranara Vindam Tavalandra Kanandam Mam Umbiran Mudikanili. The key words there Anandam Joy Arivu Knowledge. Narendra Mudam, the longevity of the life or lasting life, because they think nectar normally refer to uh, escaping from the death. So we are human beings in this uh, beautiful planet, uh, unbelievable. In the universal scale, it's less than a dot. Uh, in mathematically, it may be a dot. So the universe is infinite. It's according to Sastra as well as science, it is four and a half billion years old. So we have been evolving, evolving, evolving. 
In this evolution, just imagine, before 1998, no Google. Today, the influence of Google in the human lives is incredible. I checked yesterday, there were no PCR before 1983. Now PCR is the word <laughs> in the entire globe. And somebody from a company said to so somewhere, you got a Nobel Prize, and he thought of this idea while he was driving a car. The biotechnology lady is here. So I just read this today, the PCR. 1983 invention, I was graduating at the time. Today imagine diagnosis, molecular biology without PCR. It's unbelievable. So if you go back, there was no medical faculty in Jaffna before 1978. So now in our teaching hospital, more than 100 consultants, even our regional health officer, all are the product of medical faculty. So this is known, as, known to be a self-sufficiency. So Ramana Maharaji said, Anyata Nada De. So Anyata Nada Merakonu Manda, you got to have a self-sufficiency. So you can, it's an incredible thing. We originated this medical faculty in 1978. So in the same thing, so 1974, one of the pioneers of our uh, university, Professor Bharat Sundar Mrese, 1974, University of Jaffna, it's a knowledge hub or knowledge shrine. I say shrine of the knowledge of Yafna. So what is this, uh, you know, this, uh, if you go back again, you know, the molecular biology, this uh, uh, DNA structure, uh, the Greek and Watson, it's 1953. Today our chief guest is coming from UN. UN founded in 1945. Before that, there's no UN, there's no World Bank, there's no WHO. So that's the way the human endeavor is going on. So what is use? The use ladies here, actually when 2012, I was the convener of the use. The Professor Vasan, the and the Vice Chancellor period, we coined this word use. The Professor Ravi Rajan also there, you know, we use. I tell you the meaning of use. Take a coconut. Is my master used to say, I hear this story from my master, it, it actually, it exists in the shore of a beach, most of the coconut trees. So the coconut fall, then it's float, then it travels, but the coconut has a structure. The outer layer is prevent from choking, so that is a laminated one. Then another layer, it's the fibers, it gives the buoyancy to float. Then another layer is a husk, the skull we have. I'll relate to this later. We have a skull. So similarly we have in the coconut, there's a skull or hu this husk. In that, there's a kernel. That's a white one, like our brain. You know, look at the kernel. It's something like very protected one. Then, inside of that, there's a juice. There's a marvelous thing ever produced. Dembli. So that juice. It's the essence of everything. So there are five layers. Similarly, we have in our body, according to our ancient wisdom, Annamaya Kosam. It's the flesh and bones. Is made of our input of food. Then we have a neural system, the second one. That the air actually does a lot of things in our body. If that disturbed, then all kind of trouble come. Then we have a manomaya kosam, that is about our thinking and all this. You know, the psychiatric professor is here, so they, they really think about this. The manomaya kosam, our mind is still, we don't know where this really exists. I think the brain take a big part in it. Uh, when you go deep sleep, Ramana will say that shut down. So the manomaya kosam. Then there's the one, the intelligent system in us. 
you know our we have a retrieval system we have a memory system the wonderful computing system that is a vijnanamaya kosam vijnanam word is already ancient word that is now prevalent i think our dean was talking about deep learning artificial intelligence so that system now the analytic is the word in the science everywhere in the business medicine science everywhere the big data available those days to formulate a theory we need a case studies empirical evidence now the plenty of big data available data set is in the john hopkins about the corona they maintain a big data every day update so the big data available from all over the media now researchers no problem you know if you want to have a data set on particular species or something so this data for our region we have to produce so the analytic so analytic department there this is called sangya attributes of our body the kabila muni is the famous for that he said then we have ananda maya kosa we want all joy no matter what it is but this anandam now in cross road because most of the people think even the doctors are not exception the professionals are not exception the universities are not exceptions everywhere politicians or anybody they relate this joy with the sense gratification you know having a very cautious dinner or outing in a big hotel or some bungalows the ananda now related to sense gratification and that lead to greediness and all kind of problems and now it is a, you know prevalent in the entire society that's happened in our sri lanka also the rulers become addict to that kind of thing so that is alcohol problem gambling problem sex problem gender based problem all problem come into the sense domain but it's a warning there in the in the general realm the sense gratification bring the death forward so this is now big challenge for us because unless we address this you know holistic existence of human being is to be in joy joy should be eternal it should be a prevalent you know it should be a very enlasting one it's not uh, going there and doing something and get out of it so here in the conference use the purpose is i tell you a little story a young man like my son no somebody after being catered by the parents and the masters and the teachers and graduation he goes out of the road and looking for his openings to looking for his openings to, to carry on his life is enough rich he has a basic education so when he was looking for these openings walking along the road he saw somewhere people were going there a man on the hut sitting with the normal dress not having big jewels or anything or big cars or anything but people are offering and ask him for some offering food offering or ask him for some advice and leaving so this young man looking for opening in in his life he saw this scene then he was wondering because he just wanted to be respected people wanted to be they have a self esteem that's the most important because eating and uh, sleeping and mating and defending is not the life obviously so this man looking for self esteem and uh, you know res commanding respect from other people at this that kind of personality he was then he definitely looked for people and asked why why did you all go and pay respect to that old man he, he was pretty ordinary like of course you look educated but he was ordinary like why did you go for it then all said that man is a wise man that should be go and pay respect to him then that young man after leaving this crowd went to that old man and asked okay people call you as a wise man and paying respect how did you become wise that's the enquiry he made how do you become wise then the wise man said to him the secret of become wise hearing from the wise i became wise by hearing from the wise this is conference 
you won't get this in your life unless you participate. You can get anything from mail order. Oh, now TED Talks are there, but it's very difficult to screening. So today the conference committee, the chair, I think the dean headed this faculty and Mrs. Surya Kumar and this wonderful team. You have, I have been enjoying this on the Tinne and all these are tropical diseases, neglected one, and then we have, the, uh, I missed that yesterday one, the pre-conference session and uh, research presentation. Today we are going to hear from very, very eminent people and those who have sacrificed their life, not just for living, they carried out the research. You know, people want to have a development in everything. Everyone talk about development. All the people from Pradesh Sabah to UN talk about development. But they forget, you know, the other side of development in the companies is very important. They make it that as a matter. Research and development, R&D. There is no development without research. R&D, we call it. But in university, we put the research aside as their personal thing, done in a solitude manner, not very in organized form. So that's what we see. Even some of the undergraduates are not here. They don't want to hear. They have been so busy in accumulating this. So I really want to congratulate those who have, you know, made the effort in making this conference possible. And they really did. The accomplished people have been invited here to talk and make presentation. So the use has its purpose served. And also I want to thank the VC media because no time is going to the, you see we are very careful now because things are happening in a remote area. So only few people are available. The important thing is like the corona time, the blessing came from the video conference. Just imagine corona, Okay, without PCR in the 85, or oh, the corona time, the survival of knowledge propagation, without being this, uh, this technology, I would have assume it's one company, but there are other companies. So video conferencing became as a rescue, became a rescue. Similarly, in these days, so we have a capture everything and put it into the Thing. I know today I am speaking here uh, with few, few uh, you know, number of audience, maybe countable, but I see after a week or two, it will be hit by so many people. So that is another medium. So don't worry. This way, you know, some, some literature now we read is coming from very remote sources. Very long time ago, Din, even in my PhD, my whole idea came from a footnote that was published when I was born. That's a tool. I yesterday in the humanity conference, I spoke. There's an easy journey to other planet, a book I read. Now, you know, going to planet, you need rockets and big build up. John Kennedy station, boosters, boom, boom, boom. But the yogi, when we get a signal from other planet, whatever signal, like a Professor Ravirajan, they talk about this universe, right, getting a signal, originated from so many light years ago. The Big Bang, we are talking, because the signal originated at that time, 400 billion years ago. Still we can receive that. It's not destroyed. So those kind of things. So easy you journey to other planet. A yogi, he got the apparatus developed. He could travel. When we get some clues. Uh, today in a research alum, not to worry about the entire proceeding. One clue is enough to bring about big changes. That is the story of PCR. You read it. I, I checked yesterday. The idea came while I was driving the car. Polymerous chain reaction. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing us with such motivational words of wisdom, showing us how far we've truly come in just a few decades and how far we've still to go. Now, I kindly invite Dr. Ramya Kumar 
lecturer, Department of Community and Family Medicine, to introduce our chief guest. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing um, Dr. Alaka Singh, WHO country representative to Sri Lanka, who has graciously, uh, graciously accepted our invitation to be chief guest at the inaugural research conference of the Faculty of Medicine, Jaffna. Dr. Singh's educational background is in economics and development with a first degree from the Delhi University and advanced degrees from the College of William and Mary, Virginia, USA and Cambridge University, UK. Dr. Singh has worked in health and development for over two decades. With WHO, she has held positions at various levels of the organization, supporting countries in Southeast Asia, as well as the African and Eastern Mediterranean regions. Her technical experience focuses on health systems, primary health care, and universal health coverage. Dr. Singh has held several key WHO, uh, led, sorry, Dr. Singh has led several key WHO efforts in these areas including development of the regional strategy on universal health coverage and more recently on a regional agenda to advance and Dean has sorry um, on a regional agenda to advance primary health care in the post covid era dr singh also worked with the office of the who dg dr uh, Margaret Chang in Geneva, assisting with high-level discussions between the DG and member states. Prior to WHO, Dr. Singh worked for the uh, World Bank in New Delhi and Washington, D.C. She has uh, numerous academic contributions as well. Last year, and most recently, she served as co-editor of an issue of the Southeast Asia Journal of Public Health that captured lessons learned from the pandemic for strengthening primary health care and universal coverage in the Southeast Asian region. We are indeed fortunate that Dr. Singh assumed um, responsibilities as, as WHO country representative in Sri Lanka last May, and that she is here with us today virtually. So now I hand over to Dr. Singh to address the gathering. Thank you. How do you medicine? Medicine, Chair of the Research Conference, dignitaries and attendees. Morning. Morning. It is my pleasure, pleasure to be addressing the opening session of this research conference on behalf of WHO. At the outset, I would like to convey my heartiest congratulations on this momentous occasion of the very first research conference organized by the Faculty of Medicine. Research is a critical activity that provides evidence-based information and recommendations to set directions for the future. And conferences such as these give us the opportunity to exchange knowledge and experiences. The theme of today's event, Shaping Medical Sciences in the New Normal, is also very timely. COVID-19 has changed public health forever. The full extent of the impact is still being assessed. Estimates suggest up to 15 million excess deaths were directly or indirectly attributed to COVID-19 between January 2020 and December 2021. Further, the pandemic is not yet over. While the latest variants have proved to be milder, surge in cases is still being reported, new variants are, being, are emerging, and long COVID is yet to be fully understood. Therefore, recovery efforts must continue with preparedness and response. Pre-COVID, WHO Southeast Asia region had some of the fastest growing economies. Even during the pandemic for 2020, the average per capita economic contraction in countries of the region was already projected to be 5.3%. For Sri Lanka, superimposed on this is the most catastrophic economic and financial crisis to hit the country since independence. This is the new normal in which medical sciences must not now be shaped. 
Pre-COVID, Sri Lanka performed consistently well on all basic health indicators, which achievements above its income group. It has in fact been an example of good progress on social development with relatively slower economic growth. At the core of this success is a strong primary healthcare system that predates Alma-Ata and is based on public investment in public health. This constitutes the largest social protection effort in Sri Lanka, providing effective access to quality, affordable and equitable health services for all. Moving forward in a sustainable way, the principles of Sri Lanka's primary health care approach must be safeguarded while adjusting the health system to the country's evolving needs and towards resilience. The areas identified for discussion at this research conference are important priorities for the future in Sri Lanka. Non-communicable disease and reproductive maternal newborn child and adolescent health are key public health concerns going forward. There are several lessons learned in these areas during the pandemic for health development in the new normal. COVID-19 underlined the importance of mental health in a future NCD response, including mental health support for health workers. The implication of food insecurity on nutrition due to the economic crisis could potentially have an intergenerational impact on health. In the new normal, primary health care must integrate a multi-sectorial, multidisciplinary and a whole of society approach into existing programmatic disease control activities. I'm pleased to inform here that is an important step. Ministry of Health is leading a regional agreement on the inclusion of humanities in medical education at the upcoming WHO Southeast Asia governing body meeting in September. The significance of these attributes in practice has been emphasized in the healthy setting approach in Jaffna. Jaffna, as you know, faced the brunt of a 30-year internal conflict, which saw the decline of most of its facilities. The conflict, which affected the development of this historical city, ended in 2009, with the ensuing decade seeing rapid urbanization. As the revival of Jaffna, with an estimated population of nearly 200, 625,000, began, this urbanization caused a massive strain with congestion and unclean environments in the infrastructure, water supply system, sanitation, food safety, housing and working conditions, as well as the fast and complicated lifestyles of Jaffna citizens. These are the outcomes of many interwoven and complex factors and smoothing them out are beyond the responsibility or indeed the capacity of the health sector alone. They need efforts from various sectors working in tandem to build on all resources available and strengths to promote the health of the people in this resilient city. Against this backdrop, WHO, particularly in the Sri Lanka office, advocated our settings approach to the authorities in charge of Jaffna and also individuals and groups in, interested in injecting new life to this city. WHO act actively promotes the settings approach and its healthy settings initiatives have implement, been implemented in several locations, including cities, schools, hospitals, and workplaces across the world. The impetus for this health promotion strategy by WHO may be traced back to the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion, the outcome of the first international conference on health promotion held in Canada in 1986. The novel settings approach links the environment, and health promotion and protection programs with everyday lives of people. Settings are places that are defined through physical parameters, social context, and represent common patterns of behavior among the people within that specific setting. So what is a healthy city? A healthy city continuously creates and improves its physical and social environments and expands its community resources to enable people to support each other in performing all life functions while developing themselves into their maximum potential. WHO recommends domains of actions with the active participation of city governance. The focus is on improving the health and well being of citizens by promoting health in all policies approach, creating physical environments more conducive for health, empowering communities to create environments that support their own health 
and make the city a better place to respond to public health emergencies. In 2019, the then mayor of Jaffna, Mr. E. Arnold, heading a multi-sectorial group, embraced WHO's technical guidance. And of course, this has been followed through by the current mayor. The wide ranging Jaffna Healthy City program promotes the health of its citizens by using the settings approach to modify health determinants. Activities to create an environment conducive to health are ongoing in three sub settings of the city, schools, workplace and public spaces. For schools, the domain of actions recommended by WHO include promoting formal and informal policies, focusing on health and well-being, reducing inequities among students and teachers, creating physical and social environments supportive to health and healthy choices, and empowering students and teachers to promote their own health and well-being. The prioritized area of work in 10 schools with over 8,000 students and 400 teachers are the promotion of wash, water and sanitation and hygiene, facilities with a focus on maintaining menstrual hygiene to promote school attendance and well-being of school girls in the first instance, a sustainable solid waste management product, project with zero plastic policy and a program to overcome barriers to create opportunities for school children to engage in physical activities. The Healthy City Initiative is also instrumental in supporting these schools to plan and conduct government-directed COVID-19 prevention measures. For government offices, the recommended actions are improving governance to promote health and well-being of its workers, promoting health in all policies, reducing health inequities, creating physical and built environments to be supportive of health choices of workers and empowering the public service to promote their own health. The work focuses mainly on physical activities, healthy eating promotion, and the promotion of sustainable waste management policies and practices within office premises. For public spaces, the actions prioritized are for the implementation of a sustainable solid waste management program, capacity building of city dwellers, on new normal ways of day-to-day -day operations to effectively respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, any public health emergencies, in fact, and now, of course, the economic crisis, and promoting physical activities at all ages. Under these initiatives, a sustainable waste management program based on a household waste management survey has been designed. This is built on the capacity of the public on reducing waste and waste segregation, refraining from burning plastics, resorting to composite making and gardening at home, recycling of waste is being promoted in city and sanitary landfilling initiatives. A comprehensive public awareness campaign on risk communication related to COVID-19 in the local language of Tamil connected to the city's setting is ongoing. An effort to revise the culture of cycling as a non-motorized transport in Jaffna, meanwhile, it has also been initiated with the formulation of the Jaffna Cycle Icon WhatsApp group with weekly cycling initiatives by a group of youth. This, of course, is very appropriate for the ongoing fuel shortages. Within two years, the Jaffna Healthy City program has proved to be an effective platform to garner contributions from inter interested individuals as well as multi-stakeholders across in innovative changes. This will steer the city of Jaffna towards an equitable and resilient recovery, guiding it towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals, notably goals 3, 11, and 12, good health and well-being, sustainable cities and communities, and responsible consumption and production. With strengthened collaboration, mutual learning, and effective allocation of shared resources, the stakeholders of the Healthy City Initiative steer the city of Jaffna towards achieving the SDGs of good health and well being, sustainable cities and communities, and responsible consumption and production. WHO looks forward to documenting the Jaffna experience for potential replication in other cities and adapting it to the development needs of the new normal. I conclude my remarks by wishing you a very successful conference, and we look forward to hearing the results and discussions. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, madam. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to announce the launch of a book on the proceedings of RCMJ 2022, which will be available virtually on our website. We kindly invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor S. Sri Satkunaraja, to do the honors of launching the book. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's time to listen to our keynote speaker. To introduce the keynote speaker, let me invite Dr. P. A. D. Kunji, Head, Department of the Community Medicine and Family Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited to be here today and to have the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Rifat Atun. Professor Rifat Atun is Professor of Global Health Systems and the Faculty Chair of the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Program and the Director of Health Systems Innovation Lab at Harvard University. In 2006 to 2013, Dr. Atun was Professor of International Health Management and Head of the Health Management Group at Imperial College London. In 2008 to 2012, he served as a member of the Executive Committee team of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and malaria as the director of strategy, performance, and evaluation cluster. His research extends globally and focuses on health system performance, health system transformation, and innovation. He has published more than 400 papers in leading journals, and in 2020 and 2021, he was recognized by the Web of Science as one of the world's highly cited researchers. Professor Atun has advised many, government, many governments on health system reforms and has acted as consultant to the World Bank, World Health Organization, and leading companies. In 2020, Professor Atun was a senior advisor to the G20 presidency held in Japan. He is member of the Longitudinal Prize Committee and a board member of Movement Health 2030 that supports innovations aimed at solving major global health challenges. He is the president of the Global Surgery Foundation based in Geneva. On a final note, he is also a fascinating individual, and we are grateful for his 
keynote speech among us today. We are all very pleased to have Prof. Atun today to talk on building resilient health systems, the timely, valuable topic for all of, all of us. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Prof. Rifat Atun. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Rifat Atran. I'm Professor of Global Health Systems at Harvard University and director of, director of the Health Systems Innovation Lab. It's a real privilege and honor to contribute to the research conference of the Faculty of Medicine, Jaffna. The theme of the conference is Shaping Medical Sciences in the New Normal. My presentation will focus on building resilient health systems to effectively manage health threats. I will spe specifically focus on management of not just uh, health threats such as COVID-19, but also chronic diseases, which create a huge burden on health systems throughout the world. My presentation will first focus on the challenge health systems face because of the rapidly changing context, then the health system responses to these contextual shifts. I will then analyze the innovation to resilient health systems. First, the change in context. Health systems are facing a perfect storm. They are under pressure. There is demographic transition with aging that brings, that brings in, uh, high levels of physical and cognitive decline in elderly populations. There is, the, there is then epidemiological transition, which is producing increasing burden of chronic illness with multimorbidity. On top of that, there are pandemics and widening inequalities in relation to health outcomes. There are political transitions with higher citizen expectations from governments and from politicians. There are economic transitions with economic recession as well as high inflation leading to fiscal space constraints with limited ability of governments to uh, spent in health and other sectors. There are also sociocultural uh, transitions which fuel or accelerate the transition of chronic illness and multimorbidity, but also higher expectations. And finally, there are, there are technological transitions with remarkable innovation, but with the emergence of digital divide. But COVID-19 response has unmasked health systems underperformance. The response to COVID-19 has been fairly ineffective, inefficient, inequitable, and inadequate in terms of responsiveness to the needs of different population groups, specifically underprivileged communities. COVID-19 has produced a system-wide system -wide shock, which has led to inability to access care, with increasing foregone care, with increasing delayed care. As a result, health systems were not able to cope and this has led to reduced screening, reduced levels of diagnosis, reduced access to services and increased levels of suboptimal care. This is producing many undiagnosed cases, many late stage cases that are presenting to health systems with higher levels of morbidity, and higher levels of excess deaths and huge costs both to individuals, households, health systems and to our societies. But beyond the direct effect, direct health effect of COVID-19, there are indirect morbidity and mortality on other conditions. There is now the economic crisis around the world, there's worsening of inequalities, and there's political instability and insecurity in many countries across the world. The economic and social consequences of COVID-19 have been huge, with increasing poverty, now with food insecurity, with broken social compact between citizens and governments, and changing atti social attitudes to science with social polarizations. And this is not healthy for health systems, 
nor for our societies. The impact of COVID-19 on health outcomes have been very substantial. This is a recent study published in the International Journal of Epidemiology by Aburto and others, which shows in 27 selected countries, and here I present selected data, that between 2019 and 2020, uh, there was a, a very large decline in life expectancy at birth, both in females and males in many high-income countries. For example, in, in the United States, the decline was almost two years in the males and around 1.5 years uh, in females. Much of it attributed to COVID-19. Again, in other European countries and as well as countries of Latin America, the impact has been huge. Out of the 27 countries that were analyzed in the study, in only three countries, for example, Norway and uh, Iceland, did the uh, life expectancy at birth remain the levels that were achieved in 2019. So health systems are under great strain. They've not been able to respond to this external shock from COVID-19, and nor have they proved to be resilient because we've had first, second, third, fourth waves of COVID-19, and the systems are still struggling to mount a response. But are we surprised? I would say no. I've been working in health systems for more than 30 years across the world. And, and a lot of my work has focused on health system performance. And much of our analysis, uh, analysis shows that health systems were underperforming well before COVID-19. So let me share some of these studies with you with a specific focus on non-communicable diseases. So for example, this is a study we published in 2019 shortly before COVID-19, looking at diabetes care cascade in 29 low and middle income countries. In this study, we used national representative individual level data with biomarkers to ascertain what proportion of the population with diabetes are detected, diagnosed, treated, and adequately controlled. And the results reveal that around 64% of individuals with diabetes, and this is focusing on type 2 diabetes, are detected, but 48% are diagnosed, less than one in two. Just 45% receive treatment, and only 30% are controlled. And of course, the levels vary from 5 to 10% to 60%, uh, which is the highest level achieved among the countries that were studied. We've extended this study since then, and in, in a paper we published in Lancet in 2021, at the end of 2021, we looked at um, diabetes treatment coverage, not just looking at treatment, but also all the other interventions. For example, use of glucose lowering medications, antihypertensive medications, cholesterol lowering, cholesterol -lowering medications, diet counseling, exercise counseling, and weight loss, weight loss counseling. Again, this is a very busy slide, and each dot um, with confidence intervals shows the performance of a country with the best fit and with 95% uncertainty intervals. And we can see countries that are underperforming and those countries that lie above the best fit line. Again, the purpose of this slide is to show you that for example, in relation to antihypertensive medication, the, the levels, treatment levels are well below 60% in, in countries of different per capita income. As we go from left to right in the graph, we have countries of higher per capita income. Cholesterol level medication levels are well, well below 20% in most of the countries analyzed. Uh, and for highly cost-effective interventions such as diet counseling, exercise counseling, and weight loss counseling, again, the levels are well below 60%. Again, the evidence for these interventions are extremely well established, and these are highly cost-effective interventions, yet we're not using them. We're not using them at scale, at an optimal level to have the desired impact. We've extended this study uh, beyond diabetes to look at hypertension 
And again, in a paper we published at the end of 2019 in The Lancet, we analyze um, in for, for low income, low and middle income countries, health system performance in managing hypertension. And here we examine performance by world regions, Latin America and the Caribbean, Middle East and Central Asia, South and East Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. For example, in Latin America and the Caribbean region, out of every 100 individuals with hypertension, around 80% have their blood pressure measured. Around uh, just under 60% are diagnosed, around 40% are treated, but around 25% are adequately controlled. In South and East Asia, the levels are far worse. Around 60% have of these individuals ever have their blood pressure measured, less than 40% are diagnosed, around 25% are treated, and less than 10% achieve control. Again, hypertension is the commonest chronic disease, and its diagnosis and treatment is not complicated, yet health systems are not adequately performing in managing this condition, which is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And We've analyzed again, as with earlier studies, performance of each country at every at each step of the care cascade. And here we have countries at different levels of GDP per capita income, from low to uh, high income, a uh, low to higher income. And the reason I showed this the slide was to point to Brazil and to Costa Rica as two countries who are consistently. Uh, outperforming other countries, in fact countries that spend much more on the health sector or countries that have far higher per capita income than Brazil or Costa Rica. I'm going to come back to Brazil to try and explain why Brazil has been performing very well compared to other countries. Again, it's not just low and middle, middle income countries that are underperforming in relation to uh, chronic diseases. Uh, here, in a report that we've recently published uh, examining the, the cardiovascular disease in G20 plus countries, this is G20 countries plus Spain, there's an additional country that we analyzed, examining the performance between 1990 and 2019. Here we have uh, crude cardiovascular mortality rates and age standardized. Uh, cardiovascular mortality, disease mortality rates between 1990 and 2019. And what we see if we look at the crude levels, uh, between 1990 and 2005, there was a steady decline in many countries with the exception of countries like Mexico where levels have been increasing. Um, but between 2005 and 2015, there has been a plateauing of the decline and after 2015 the levels have begun to increase and even with age standardized levels we can see the initial decline has not been sustained and we're reaching a, a plateauing of the uh, of the achievements um, and of course these results are before COVID-19 and the mortality levels are likely to be far higher given some of the published studies that shows the adverse impact of COVID-19 on access to healthcare as well as management of cardiovascular disease. So the performance is not just, in, not just in low and middle income countries, but also in high income countries. So we're not managing chronic disease well, and the consequences are terrible. If we look at the global cost of NCDs, um, this is a study that was published by my colleagues at Harvard uh, several years ago now in 2013. Then they estimated that diabetes uh, led to 47 trillion uh, dollars of loss in economic output in the period 2011 to 2025. And each year, around 40 million individuals uh, die from chronic diseases, around 70% of all global deaths. We estimated more recently the global economic cost of diabetes uh, globally uh, from 2015 to 2030. And just for diabetes, 
we were able to uh, estimate that in 2015, the economic cost was $1.3 trillion, accounting for 1.8% of global gross domestic product. By 2013, um, if we continue with business as usual, with the past trends, this cost will increase to 2.48 trillion, increasing to 2.2% of global GDP. If we're able to achieve the SDG 3.4 target and reduce by one third the mortality levels from uh, diabetes, the economic cost will be 2.12 trillion, accounting for 1.8% of GDP. Again, the, so human and economic costs are huge. Of course, the, the costs are not just uh, large scale and, and country level, there are also huge cost consequences for individuals because there is catastrophic expenditure incurred by um, individuals with chronic diseases. With, with a study that um, we participated in that I was, uh, I was a co-author published in The Lancet in 2018, revealing that around, in some communities, around 60% of some population, uh, some patient populations with NCDs suffer catastrophic health expenditures because of high cost of medicines. Yet, we have highly cost-effective interventions. Again, the World Health Organization estimates in its uh, best buys recommendations that in low, and middle, in low income countries, average per person per year cost for managing NCDs is less than $1 per person. In low middle income countries, this level is $1.50. And in high middle income countries, in upper middle income countries, this is less than $2.5. So there's a lot of evidence, highly cost-effective interventions, yet very substantial underperformance of health systems with huge uh, consequences for individuals, households, countries, and economies. But if you were to invest to scale up interventions, the economic returns are very substantial. For every um, uh, so the economic returns, the benefit cost ratio of investing in the best buys for NCDs would, for every dollar invested would yield 2.3 to 10 dollars. But the economic and, and social returns combined would be even higher. For every dollar invested, the levels would increase to 3.8 to 20 dollars of benefit. Very, very large returns. Yet we're not investing adequately or optimally in managing NCDs. But why? Why have we become so complacent in managing the major conditions that kill most of the, that account for most of the deaths around the world each year? Well, part of the reason is because health systems have failed to innovate. Um, and whereas on the one hand, we have delivery of technological innovations, for example, um, mic, uh, laboratories, uh, near health, handheld devices, lab on a chip, use of big data and analytics, transitioning to precision health or population level targeted health, innovation in delivery, i.e. in new delivery models, care delivery models, has not changed very much since the 7th century, in fact. This is a picture of Hotel Dieu de Paris, which was established in 651 as a hospital. It is still functioning in Paris as a hospital. Although it was burned down, it was rebuilt and has continued to function almost uninter uninterrupted from the 7th century. So when I say the innovation and delivery has been slow, I'm not exaggerating. And I tried to capture this in an op-ed I did, I published in the Financial Times a couple of years ago, where I argued that it was time to transform healthcare delivery, not just incrementally change it. Um, and I argued that where scientific developments have led to unprecedented delivery of innovations in relation to new medicines, diagnostics and health technologies, innovation and delivery had, had faltered. This is one of the reasons why we have a mismatch between what is needed and what is being 
delivered and produced by health systems. The second challenge is the institutional logic. We've been captured by broken health systems and we've not really made an effort to make transformative change. And Einstein argued that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. But he also said that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we created them. So we need to rethink how we can develop health systems that are responsive to major health threats, but also resilient to ongoing health threats over time. Threats that currently exist and threats that will impact on health systems in the future. Clearly, the current approaches have not yielded the desired results. So, what can we do? How can we build resilient health systems? Well, the Chinese and Japanese characters for crisis and opportunity are the same. Every crisis brings an opportunity and COVID-19 crisis does bring an opportunity to, to rethink and to build responsive and resilient health systems. And we've argued in a paper we published in BMJ Global Health um, last year that we should shift our paradigm and use these disease outbreaks such as COVID-19 to build resilient health systems, not just wait for the events to end, but actually use this as an opportunity to continuously improve and introduce major changes. So what is resilience? Well, resilience is capacity to adapt. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a well-developed and applied concept in engineering. It's the ability of a system to absorb shocks while retaining system functionality, ability to self-organize and to learn to innovate, to establish a new equilibrium to manage the changing context and the changing insults. And developing uh, resilient health systems and responsive health systems can produce sustainability because sustainability means responsiveness to emerging challenges and resilience to new and ongoing health threats and shocks. In terms of health system resilience, there are uh, one needs to build core capabilities. And I've identified five core capabilities. The first is foresight knowing what to expect. That requires proactive monitoring and horizon scanning to understand what is, in the, what is in the horizon. Obviously, we cannot predict everything, but we can have a good sense of what might be uh, emerging. So th these are the known knowns. Secondly, second capability is intelligence, knowing what to look for. This requires analytic capabilities, analyzing available data to understand how systems are performing, how systems are prepared going forward. The third core cap capability is preparedness, knowing what to do when there is a health threat. This is the ability to react rapidly to emerging and uh, changing health threats. Fourth capability is agility, knowing how to act and to adapt in the face of a health threat and the ability to maintain function or functionality with changing events. And final, uh, the fifth core capability is durability. This is knowing what happened, how and why. And this means learning, learning what has happened and using this, this intelligence to be designed to establish a new equilibrium to manage uh, emerging, existing, and future health threats. And building resilient health systems uh, is critically important, but we also need to ensure that we're building high value health systems because the amount of resources are limited. So we need to ensure that we're getting value for money by improving effectiveness and efficiency, but also value for many, for everyone, by improving equity and also by improving responsiveness of needs of different population groups. And we've suggested different approaches to achieve high value health systems in different settings in a book we've recently written uh, with my colleague uh, Gordon Moore, who's a professor at uh, Harvard Medical School. And with resilient health systems, 
what we are trying to achieve is exactly that high value health systems that are sustainable systems that create value for money with greater effectiveness and more efficient use of available resources and value for many by ensuring equity equitable access to health healthcare services and health interventions to have equitable outcomes health outcomes and responsiveness responsiveness to citizen expectations and to different population needs and also to changing context as i mentioned earlier because health has instrumental and intrinsic value and we need to argue for investing in health to achieve value for money and value for many so how do we build resilient health systems how do we achieve these five core capabilities here i argue that we can do this through uh, five uh, interventions what i call the five eyes the first is in changing our institutional logic we need to rethink about redesigning health systems clearly the current designs are not helping and are not suitable to managing current and emerging needs second is inclusive partnerships strategic public private partnerships built on inclusion inclusion and inclusive approaches mutual trust shared values and solidarity these threats affect everyone and it's responsible of everyone in a country to use all the available resources to achieve results that benefit everyone. The third is integrated action, multi-sectoral action to respond and be resilient to emerging and existing threats. Fourth is investment in health, recognizing the importance of health for individuals, economies and societal well-being. And not consider uh, health just as an expenditure, but a real investment that can yield very substantial benefits for individuals, households, and economies, as I've illustrated earlier. Fifth is innovation at scale. This is large-scale innovation, and not just technologies, but innovation and delivery to achieve services and systems that produce higher value for money and value for many. So I'm going to focus on, on redesign of the health systems and partnerships uh, given the limited time available. In, in order to achieve uh, high performing health systems that, are, that generate high value for money and high value for many and that are resilient, we need to invest in building strong primary healthcare systems embedded in communities that are very inclusive. There's strong evidence, um, many reviews uh, have, have uh, identified that increased availability of primary health care or strong primary health care is associated with improved equitable access, improved cost effectiveness of the system as a whole, enhanced user satisfaction with the health system, and better health, health outcomes for the population as a whole. And in a report I, I, I did for the World Health Organization in 2004, I compared countries that were hospital centric versus health systems that were much more focused on primary health care services to show through a review what the benefits, benefits of a primary care focused health system was. And further analyze how one could improve health system responsiveness to management to manage effective management of non-communicable diseases. Again, this is a paper with uh, Peter Piot and um, colleagues such as uh, Senya Nishtar, where we uh, analyze what could be done to more effectively respond to health threats from chronic illnesses in low and middle income countries. And we found that uh, the best approaches were multi-sectoral responses, approaches that use existing delivery platforms. In many countries, there are often vertical programs for tuberculosis or for HIV or for management of malaria, or for reproductive health, or for maternal and child health. Again, bringing this together, using these existing platforms to expand and strengthen primary health care, but in an integrated way. And third, we found that uh, improving responsiveness of health systems to chronic diseases was to create uh, technology-enabled 
new primary healthcare delivery models. Again, technology is highly scalable and the marginal cost of expansion using technology is quite low compared to expanding human resources that, that A is difficult because of lack of human resources and B costly because of um, training and, and salaries that need to, need to be paid. I'm not saying we should not be investing in human, human resources, of course, but these incredibly important assets, human resources could be better used by, uh, by utilizing technologies to enable and empower health professionals and human resources in health systems. In a further study looking at management of uh, diabetes in Sub-Saharan Africa, we examined some of the innovations that were emerging in the Sub-Saharan African context to manage diabetes, again in countries that have low per capita income or low expenditures on health. And there are four important common features of these innovations. The first was using low-cost and accessible technologies. But very importantly, using a public health approaches, targeting both individuals and population health at primary health care level. Third feature was using new cadres of health workforce, for example, community health workers or health assistants, or in the case of Ethiopia, health extension workers with, in, uh, with um, individuals with three to six months of training, um, enabling them to manage a core set of public health and healthcare interventions that account for the greatest burden of disease in countries. And these approaches have been very effective. And finally, and critically, community involvement. Providing community and peer support to individuals with conditions, with chronic conditions, and also encouragement, again, using technology for self-management, because chronic illnesses um, happen over tens, um, tens of years. It's not an acute event where one, is, one receives treatment and the condition resolves. Chronic diseases have to be managed over 20, 30, 40, even 50 years in, in many, many, uh, in the case of most individuals. So let me share with you an example of, of one successful country. If you remember in my slide, I showed that Brazil was a outlier, a high performer consistently in managing chronic conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. So how has Brazil uh, managed to achieve that, this high performance? Again, we examined this as part of the Lancet Latin America series, which I had the privilege of leading. Um, we examined universal health coverage in, using, in, in, 10, in 10 countries in Latin America. And we, and we examined different responses and the transition to universal health coverage and the responses and results these countries have achieved. And Brazil was an outlier. Um, following, the, um, following the end of the, the military dictatorship uh, in the 1990s, Brazil, uh, as part of the democratization process, invested in building a unified health system. They invested in building uh, a health system to deliver universal health coverage with financing reforms that expanded access and provided social protection through universal health coverage and enhanced service delivery and the quality of services provided by strengthening primary health care through a family health strategy, which involved improvement of sub, um, improvement of um, family health teams or creation of family health teams with improved supply of diagnostics and medicines and use of outreach through community health workers. At the same time, in the Brazilian health system, there was a strong effort and emphasis on strengthening public health for managing both personal and community level health risks. And between 1998, um, with the start of the, with following the new constitution and transition to democracy, and 2012, this is a study we published um, a couple of years ago, analyzing the expansion of primary health care. And here, uh, blue dots uh, or blue areas uh, refer to uh, areas with higher density of family health teams, where areas that are white 
are those with zero coverage. As you can see in 1998, most of the country was, um, had very low levels of primary health care coverage. But by 2012, it was a rapid expansion of primary health care through the family health strategy with increasing availability of family health teams and community that included community health workers. And that, that has led to a rapid reduction of uh, infant mortality, under five mortality and maternal mortality. Um, and this is one figure from the same study that shows whereas in 1990s, Brazil was one of the worst performers with uh, infant mortality levels uh, at 50 per thousand live births. By 2011, uh, it had the sharpest decline converging with uh, other countries that were included uh, in the study. So very rapid declines. But in addition to improving infectious diseases uh, and infant mortality, under five mortality and maternal mortality, there was also a massive reduction in in uh, mortality from chronic diseases. Again, this is a paper we published um, in, uh, in Health Affairs where we examine reductions in amenable mortality. Again, this is, these are deaths that can be prevented or uh, they can be, or conditions that can be effectively treat, treated to prevent death, mostly chronic diseases. And we're able to demonstrate large reductions in amenable mortality associated with expansion of primary health care. Again, we use data from uh, thousands of municipalities with different levels of expansion of family health teams to demonstrate the, the effects or the association in this case. What we found was that um, rapid increase or increase in family health teams and primary health care led to reductions in amenable mortality, but the increases were far larger in the presence of strong health governance. So where there was good health management or good management of the health sector, there was the reductions were far greater, almost four times greater in, in municipalities with strong health governance compared to um, municipalities with low levels of health governance. So that shows the importance of uh, investing in cost-effective interventions and primary health care but also having in place a strong management and governance to achieve better results. Now, the, the second item I wanted to examine in relation to the five eyes I talked about that are needed to create a resilient health system is inclusive partnerships to develop innovation ecosystems to ensure uh, interdependence between um, and within countries, but also adequate independence and self-sufficiency. And that involves bringing together uh, universities where research takes place, where science is developed, where training takes place to generate innovations, working with private sector or with foundations, not-for-profit foundations, to use the science to translate them into usable services, but also working with health systems and communities to ensure that these new services that are designed are, are uh, applied widely. They are taken up and they diffuse throughout the system to achieve scale, to ensure value for money, but also value for many. So dear colleagues, um, it's a real opportunity to, a uh, real privilege to contribute to, uh, to this conference. Clearly many health systems are under pressure uh, COVID-19 has revealed the underperformance that existed and has unmasked the extent of underperformance. But this crisis provides an opportunity to redesign health systems, to rethink what kind of health systems that need to be in place. And clearly this is going to be technology enabled, primary health, strong primary health care systems that are person centric to manage not just emerging health threats, but also existing health threats from non-communicable diseases. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Professor Rifat Atun, for taking time out of your busy schedule to share such enlightening thoughts with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's a time for a break. I would like to request all our guests to move towards the front lobby of our Hua Auditorium. We will resume here at 10.35 a.m. Thank you.
now we are entering into the first symposium of today, which is based on the burden of non-communicable diseases, ongoing research activities, and future directions. The first symposium will be chaired by Professor T. Kumanan, Professor of Medicine, Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, <laughs> University of Jaffna, and Senior Consultant Physician, Teaching Hospital, Jaffna. And Dr. Mrs. J. Pradeepan, Senior Lecturer, Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna, and Consultant Physician, Teaching Hospital, Jaffna. The honorable resource persons participating in the first symposium are Professor Darren Tay, Senior Consultant, Singapore General Hospital. Dr. Vigneshwaran Namasivayam, Clinical Assistant Professor, Senior Consultant, Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Singapore General Hospital. And Dr. M. Gurubaran, Consultant Cardiologist, Teaching Hospital, Jaffna. I humbly invite Professor T. Kumanan, Dr. Mrs. J. Pradeepan, and Dr. M. Guruparan to take their seats on the stage, please. And Dr. Vigneshwaran Namasivaya and Professor Darante will join us through the virtual platform. We would also like to take this time to mention that once the speeches have ended, the floor is open for discussion, and we invite the audience to participate. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's move on to the first symposium of the day, Burden of Non-Communicable Diseases, Ongoing Research Activities, and Future Directions. We have uh, three eminent speakers. I would like to introduce the first speaker of the symposium, Professor Darren Tay. He is currently working as Senior Consultant, Singapore General Hospital. Dr. Darren Tay graduated from the National University of Singapore in 1999. He then finished his orthopedic residency training in 2009 and went on to complete his clinical fellowship in hip and knee arthroplasty at the Southampton General Hospital UK from 2010 to 2011. He has been practicing at the Singapore General Hospital as a consultant, senior orthopedic surgeon since 2016. He's also currently adjunct assistant professor with both the Nuss Young Lu in Lin School of Medicine and the Duke Nuss Medical School and co-faculty in the Singh Health Orthopedic Residency Program. His main interest in adult reconstruction surgery include minimally invasive partial knee resurfacing, complex primary and revision joint replacements, and robotic assisted hip and knee arthroplasty. Besides being involved in medical teaching, Dr. Tay is involved in organizing local arthroplasty courses and frequently travels overseas, both regionally and internationally, as an invited speaker and to conduct arthroplasty workshop. Let's listen to Professor Tay. He will participate virtually. Good afternoon to all in attendance. First of all, I would Good afternoon like to, to thank all in attendance. Organizing committee. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for this gracious invitation to participate in this event. It is indeed an honor for me to introduce my department and how we have been kept occupied during the last two and a half years dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Darren, and I am the Deputy Head of Orthopedic Department, Singapore General Hospital. 
The Singapore General Hospital is the oldest and largest government hospital on the island. Tracing our roots back to 1821, we celebrated our hospital's bicentennial anniversary last year. On campus in the southern part of Singapore, we have 2,200 inpatient beds at this moment, shared between the main hospital and the integrated community hospital. Our orthopedic department shares similar characteristics to the hospital, being also the oldest and largest orthopedic department on the island. We celebrate our 70th anniversary this year and have a headcount of 45 surgeons spread amongst seven orthopedic subspecialty services. Looking at our pre-pandemic workload figures, it consists of around 115 to 125,000 outpatient visits and 7,500 to 8,500 surgeries per annum. Prior to the pandemic, our hospital was actually amid gearing up for future expansion plans to meet the nation's healthcare demands of an increasing and aging population. These plans included a new elective care center, which would come with an additional 300 beds and 20 operating theaters. Unfortunately, all these plans were shelved and placed on the back burner with the first imported case of COVID-19 in Singapore. And this was on the 23rd of January, 2020. Since then, our national exposure to COVID-19 has been classified into waves. The first wave consisted of infected travelers or contacts of travelers from the Chinese city of Wuhan, Hubei. And currently we are in our fifth wave of COVID-19 with the new variants. By the 7th of February 2020, our national disease threat level was stepped up from DOSCON, yellow, to orange. With the raise of this threat level, we were instructed by our health ministry to cease all elective orthopedic surgeries and to postpone non-essential outpatient clinics. At that point of time, to prevent widespread transmission of the virus amongst our department and staff, we went into a functional segregation in order to provide only essential orthopedic services. Our department and medical manpower was divided into three separate subunits. One subunit was to take care of the patients in the wards, one was to be only rostered to the operating theatres and the last subunit was to run the outpatient clinics. At that time, education and research activities were suspended. These subunits were isolated from each other and operated independently, each headed by one of three deputy heads of departments and we reported daily to our head of department. Only time-critical surgeries such as infection, tumour, trauma and spine cases with neurological deterioration were permitted to proceed. Our second wave consisted mainly of citizens returning back to Singapore from overseas studies and employment overseas and traced to prior travel to Europe, North America and other cities in Asia. By end March 2020, we saw multiple new local clusters and an increased number of unlinked cases, heralding the start of the third wave from significant local transmission. Over this period, Singapore adopted an aggressive approach to test and isolate all positive cases and quarantine close contacts. As a result of this, there was an increasing strain on local medical resources from the community practice to the government hospitals and to our National Center for Infectious Disease. As our elective workload had been halted, the hospital began to mobilize our departmental manpower to augment our emergency and medical departments that had started to become overwhelmed with an increasing number of COVID-19 cases. 
our staff were initially deployed to a newly created flu screening area, which was set up at a nearby multi-storey car park on campus. This setup was in order to decompress the workload at the emergency department. Subsequently, our manpower was also diverted off-site to the National Centre for Infectious Diseases, which was where the main bulk of Singapore's COVID-19 patients were being managed and isolated at that time. The community spread in the population appeared to become under control and manageable through an aggressive circuit breaker period during April 2020. During this circuit breaker, nationwide school and non-essential workplace closures were enforced with enhanced social distancing and reduced human traffic. However, we saw large clusters of infection start to develop within foreign worker dormitories. As such, our medical and nursing manpower was also deployed to foreign worker dormitories to provide medical care. Additionally, community care facilities were set up across the island and these were to provide medical care to the workers who were being isolated and quarantined and as a result, our healthcare staff were deployed there as well. Given the demand of manpower on our department due uh, to staff COVID operations, the functional segregation of our department was untenable and we had to subsequently reorganize the department into two sub-departments which remained as much as possible separated and out of physical interaction with each other. Each sub-department would have surgeons from across all seven sub-specialties. The idea behind this concept was for the purpose of business continuity and that in the event that either of the sub-departments became infected or compromised, there would be a remaining orthopedic element left to hold the fort and provide orthopedic services while the other subunit recovered. There were provisions made to allow some orthopedic elective surgery to be performed. This was to be done in a measured and calibrated fashion where we started off only utilizing 50% of our operating theater resources. At that time, some of our manpower was still deployed to assist medical departments, and so it was prudent not to overtax the system and have a slow, careful resumption of services. However, given that there was still a great demand for inpatient beds for isolation and care of COVID-19 patients, we recognized that if our department was to have a meaningful resumption of services, we would need to rethink the way we delivered our orthopedic care. We would need to look at reducing elective demands on inpatient beds, as well as reducing the need for patients to return physically to the hospital. And this led us to two initiatives. The first initiative was ERAS or Enhanced Recovery After Surgery for our hip and knee replacement patients. We wanted to look at ERAS as a way to reduce the length of stay for our post-operative patients. We began by looking and targeting on our largest patient population, our hip and knee replacement patients. Pre-pandemic, we performed around 1,800 primary knee replacements and 300 total hip replacements per year. We were able to achieve a reduction in the length of stay by appropriate patient selection, careful discharge criteria, and the introduction of several changes to the patient journey, including careful preoperative counseling by the doctor, education of the patients preoperatively via a joint replacement class conducted by our physiotherapists, regular patient home visits by our physiotherapists and nurses so that patients did not have to return to the hospital, and a hotline for patients to easily get in touch with our medical staff if the need arose. 
As a result of this effort, we were able to convert many patients to same-day discharge or next-day discharge through the setup of a short-stay ward and free up large amounts of inpatient beds as well as an additional benefit of reducing overall healthcare costs. We were able to do this in a safe manner without increasing post-operative complications. The next initiative was telemedicine, and this was done to reduce the amount of patient traffic in the hospital. The rapid push for telemedicine was to give us the capability to reach out to patients, provide timely medical reviews, and have their medications delivered to them without them having to be physically present in the hospital. As a result of this initiative, we were able to reduce patient congestion and traffic at the hospital for routine non-urgent outpatient care. We had to work with various stakeholders to ensure that patient data was kept private and confidential and to develop a standardized workflow to ensure a smooth process. We identified a set of guidelines to allow us to triage patients into either essential or non-essential conditions as the list shows. Those with non-essential conditions, such as long-term follow-up for previous fractures, healed wounds, stable osteoporosis, uh, post-operative patients uh, having their long-term follow-ups, uh, were offered the options of being reviewed via teleconsultation. Additionally, with the use of technology, we were also able to tap onto mobile apps to bring patients through basic physical exercises for their post-operative rehab. As a result of this, we were able to reduce the number of patients that required to return to hospital for physiotherapy sessions. With the use of smart sensors post-operatively, these sensors connected across patient joints allow us to monitor remotely the patient's range of motion, activity level, and recovery following surgery. At this point in time, our battle with COVID-19 is far from over as the virus continues to mutate and become increasingly contagious. The virus still poses a very large challenge to healthcare two and a half years since it had appeared. We are still experiencing high numbers of infections and now reinfections in the community, and we are certainly not back to normalcy as we knew it in 2019. However, I think that we have to learn to accept that this may be the new normal for the foreseeable future, and we will need to continue to calibrate our practice between business as usual and the higher needs of the hospital and population, depending on the ever-changing scenario. We will need to remain limber and adaptable and continue to innovate and adopt new strategies and postures as the threat evolves. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Professor Tay, for sharing his experience of orthopedic services during the COVID-19 pandemic in Singapore. Let me introduce the second speaker for this symposium, Dr. Vikneswaran Namasivayam, Senior Consultant, Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Singapore General Hospital. Dr. Vikneswaran is a Senior Consultant attached to the de Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Singapore General Hospital. He obtained his medical degree from National University of Singapore in, 2000, in the year of 2000 and his specialist accreditation in gastroenterology in 2009. He completed an advanced fellowship at Mayo Clinic Rochester, USA and further attachment at National Cancer Center Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. 
His main area of training is in endoscopic resection of early cancers and advanced endoscopic imaging techniques for early cancer and polyp detection in the esophagus, stomach, and colon. His training also encompasses gastroesophageal reflux disease and motility disorder. He performs pH impedance testing, Bravo capsule insertion, and esophageal manometry for the evaluation of reflux and swallowing disorder and endoscopic dilatation of strictures and achalasia. He's actively involved in research in therapeutic endoscopy, reflux and motility disorders, and colorectal cancer. He has authored several publications in peer-reviewed international journals and book chapters, and he served as a reviewer for several GI journals. In addition, he has also served as an invited speaker and faculty at several conferences and endoscopic workshop in the region. Without further delay, we will listen to Dr. Vigneswaran about endoscopic treatment of GI cancer. Morning, everyone. I'm Vignesh from Singapore General Hospital. I'm a gastroenterologist. And it gives me great pleasure to join all our delegates from all across the world um, at this um, conference organized by Jaffna University. Thank you for having me. And I'll be happy to share with you our experiences uh, in, in the endoscopic treatment of gastrointestinal cancer. All right, this has been arguably been one of the more exciting developments in the field of gastroenterology over the last one or two decades. I think most of us are familiar with the idea of surgery as a definitive treatment modality for our cancers, as a curative modality. But what we now recognize is that cancers that are detected at a very early stage or at a precancerous stage, all right, may be even amenable to organ sparing endoscopic treatment. And in this regard, I think most of us are familiar with the idea of a colonoscopy polypectomy. All right, so. Uh, very often we encounter patients who present with altered bowel habits, rectal bleeding, we put in a scope and we see something like this on the image on the right, a frank cancer, all right, that is reasonably advanced and giving rise to symptoms. And the patient undergoes surgery and possibly with some chemo radiation, all right, uh, with a guarded uh, long-term outlook, all right. And this is a situation that is largely preventable, all right, if you can perform a colonoscopy at an asymptomatic phase where we identify a precancerous polyp that gives rise to the cancer, all right? So by detecting this polyp and removing it, we basically arrest this progression to cancer, all right? So this is the basic idea of colorectal cancer prevention, all right? And it forms, and this paradigm forms the basis of uh, uh, recommendations for colorectal cancer screening throughout the world. The idea that you can find, detect a precancerous lesion and remove it, all right? <clears throat> and this is very easily done because polyps uh, in the colon are very easily identified uh, most of the time, all right? And you see this little mushroom sticking out into the, into the lumen. And that can be resected very easily, all right, by general endoscopists with techniques that have now become pretty commonplace, huh? a polypectomy where we basically deploy a snare <clears throat> and we strangulate the polyp and we cut it out, all right? What we now recognize is that this is a paradigm uh, that can also be applied throughout the rest of the gut, all right? The esophagus, the stomach. And so long as you can pick up a cancer at a relatively early stage, um, it may be resectable. All right, um, even before it becomes a cancer. And in this re regard, all right, just like we have polyps, precancerous polyps giving rise to colorectal cancer, uh, we have uh, corresponding precancerous precursors in the stomach and in the esophagus. All right, so in the gastric, in the stomach, we have gastric dysplastic lesions. In the esophagus, you can have two different cancers, the squamous cell carcinoma, which is preceded, which is preceded by dysplastic lesions, um, as well as esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, which occurs in the setting of a Barrett's esophagus, which is a change in the lining of the esophagus from squamous to columnar, uh, which can give rise to dysplastic lesions <clears throat> that lead to uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. All right. So in the interest of time, I'm going to focus primarily on uh, stomach cancer for the rest of the talk. All right. But I'll be happy to take uh, questions on uh, the other cancers as well. 
But the basic idea is this, all right? A superficial GI neoplasia, you know, even a cancer, all right? <clears throat> so long as it has no lymph node metastasis, may be resected endoscopically. All right, but this in turn creates challenges of its own. <clears throat> all right, this is, uh, if you were to look at the images on the right, all right, uh, it's basically two different patients with stomach cancer. All right, that bottom right image basically shows a patient with an advanced gastric cancer. All right, this is a picture of the uh, antrum. All right, and what you can make out quite uh, clearly here is a nodule with some ulceration here in keeping with an advanced gastric cancer. And typically the patient would have presented with some dyspepsia, anemia, weight loss, all right? And, and this is usually associated with a guarded outlook. And what you're really trying to pick up in early gastric cancer is something uh, more in keeping with the image on the top, all right? Where you can basically make out this faint patch of red uh, in the antrum. And this is what an early gastric cancer looks like, all right? And often it is asymptomatic, a lesion like this typically does not give rise to symptom. And what this basically means is that this is often a serendipitous finding or an incidental finding in someone who has undergone endoscopy for an unrelated indication or has undergone endoscopy for cancer surveillance. All right? <clears throat> and you'd appreciate the challenges involved in this in that, number one, the lesion is very subtle, which means that you know, it's harder to detect. And unlike in the colon um, that I showed you earlier where you have nice mushroom-looking polyps, in this case, what you have is just a patch of ray. All right? So the conventional polypectomy techniques that... Uh, most people are accustomed to uh, would not be applicable in this setting, which means that you need to have newer techniques and uh, um, tools uh, for resecting uh, cancers in this setting. All right, and this basically gives rise to develop. This has given rise to the development of advanced endoscopic imaging modalities, as well as endoscopic resection techniques. Uh, broadly speaking, you know, endoscopic resection (EMR, ESD), as well as ablative techniques that are used to treat at-risk mucosa. All right, and it also gives rise to the larger question of trying to identify patients who may be at risk of developing these cancers, as well as you know, mucosa, at-risk mucosa that may be prone to developing cancers. And I'll try and touch on each of these uh, as we move along using the stomach as an example. Right. I'm sure by now you're all familiar with the idea that H. pylori infection gives rise to stomach cancer. All right, and this, uh, and this accounts for the vast majority of stomach cancers. And, and this is something that generally occurs through a stepwise cascade of events, right? You have H. pylori infection giving rise to gastritis, atrophic gastritis. Some of these patients go on to develop intestinal metaplasia, which is a change in the epithelial lining of the stomach. And a small minority of these patients then pro progress to develop dysplasia, which is a precancerous lesion, of which there are two types, the low-grade dysplastic lesions as well as the high-grade dysplasia. Um, and, and some of these patients go on to develop carcinoma. All right. And if you were to apply the paradigm that I've just spoken about recent, uh, earlier, all right, patients with dysplasia and cancer all right, may be candidates for endoscopic intervention. All right. And the fact that this occurs through a cascade of events raises the, the prospect of, surveilling, of uh, surveillance uh, for a subset of uh, patients with intestinal metaplasia who may be at increased risk of uh, progressing through this cascade towards cancer. All right. So when we'll touch on each of these ideas in turn. All right. So first, let's talk about endoscopic intervention. But before we do that, I think you'd appreciate the idea that you know, this cascade of events is somewhat analogous to the colon, as I just mentioned earlier. All right, so the idea being to identify precancerous lesions, resect the lesion, thereby prevent arresting its progression to cancer, and using the findings in turn as a means of uh, stratifying the risk of subsequent cancer. All right, so this is the endoscopic image of the entrance of another patient, all right? And this is a, a view, you know, that many endoscopists may be familiar with, all right? A patch of redness in the stomach, entrance, which often on casual inspection may be dismissed as being insignificant or, or just merely gastritis, all right? <clears throat> which is a common finding on endoscopy. All right, but when you zoom in closer with magnification, you begin to appreciate the fact that the mucosa looks very different from a normal entral mucosa, right? And then we switch to narrowband imaging. All right, what narrowband imaging does is that it is an optical uh, imaging modality that is uh, found on our endoscopes that is operated by pressing a button. And what it does is that it filters the wavelength of light that is shown into the stomach. All right, so that it filters it into two very narrow spectrum uh, of light, which uh, is targeted towards highlighting blood vessels. All right, and why do we focus on blood vessels? Because neoplastic tissue has a different vascular signature compared to normal gastric mucosa. All right. And you then begin to appreciate the fact that over here, there are all these irregular blood vessels that appear brown all right, on, on narrowband imaging on NBI. All right. And this is the optical signature of a gastric cancer. 
All right, and this patient subsequently underwent endoscopic resection. And the final resection histology was that this was a gastric intramucosal adenocarcinoma. All right, so what I've done is to hide, um, illustrate to you how endoscopy now allows us to actually identify these cancers, detect these cancers, as well as to make a real-time endoscopic diagnosis of an early gastric cancer, even before a biopsy is taken. <clears throat> All right, and these cancers, if detected at a sufficiently early stage, may be actually resected endoscopically. All right, without the patient actually requiring a gastrectomy. All right, and this is again an illustration from another patient. All right, again, this is a, a, a faint lesion in the antrum, all right, which is barely perceptible, apart from some blood from bruising of the scope. All right, one that could have been easily missed or dismissed as being insignificant. And then when we switch to an NBI, you begin to appreciate that compared to the surrounding green mucosa, this looks brownish and you can make out the abnormal blood vessels. And, and ladies and gentlemen, this is a uh, an optical diagnosis of a gastric neoplasia. All right, so there are several different optical uh, imaging modalities out there right now that are widely used throughout the world. <clears throat> and, and, and increasingly, there's a, there's a growing body of evidence to suggest that many of these are useful in detecting patients with at-risk mucosa and in detecting and characterizing gastric neoplasia. And, and <clears throat> this is one of the red, uh, randomized controlled trials that was performed by our unit uh, in conjunction with our colleagues at Changi General Hospital where we evaluated link color imaging, uh, which is another uh, um, advanced endoscopic imaging modality. And what we demonstrated was that compared to white light endoscopy, this allowed us to increase the detection of atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia, and other uh, precancerous lesions in the stomach. All right, which then you know, contributes to the growing body of evidence that supports the use of uh, uh, advanced endoscopic imaging modalities for the detection and characterization of neoplasia in the upper GI tract. All right, so what do we do once we've identified a cancer? All right, and this is a, a, a video of a patient who underwent endoscopic resection of a cancer. This was an elderly patient who actually underwent variceal surveillance because uh, the patient had uh, liver cirrhosis and was found to have an early gastric cancer. And this has been demarcated by coaptation and you can actually barely make out this tumor, all right? So this was an early gastric cancer. And what we do is to basically slice out the tumor from the rest of the stomach wall. And the way we do this is by marking out the tumor, the, the boundaries of the tumor. Then we inject a colloidal solution, in this case, gelafundin, all right, into the submucosal space. And what that does is to separate the mucosa, which contains the tumor, from the rest of the muscle wall, all right, thereby allowing us to slice the mucosa. Then we make a mucosal incision. All right, which is a cut around the border, the border of the tumor, all right, to give us access into the submucosal space. All right? And you notice that there's this blue layer here, which is the submucosal space. And the reason why it is blue is because the colloid that we have injected contains some indigo carmine. Uh, and, and we color it so that we can identify the submucosal space better when we do our resection. All right? And you can make out the submucosal blood vessels here. All right? And these are coapted with hemostatic forceps. All right, that allows us to coagulate these vessels so that when we cut the submucosa, they don't bleed. So I'm going to speed things up here a little. All right, so now what we're doing is that we're basically cutting through the submucosal plane. All right, this is the dissection all right, with an endoscopic knife. Keeping in mind that all of this is done through a scope, all right, so there's no abdominal incision involved. All right, so all of this is done endoscopically. All right, and the tumor is sliced. And, and again, because we're cutting into the submucosa, you do encounter big vessels which have to be dealt with. All right. And at this four o'clock, here's a muscle layer which you don't want to cut through because if you do, you may end up with a perforation. All right. So this whole area is barely a few millimeters. All right. But endoscopy allows us to slice out the tumor. And what you're left with here is a muscle as the base. All right. You're basically left with an ulcer base. And with PPI, all right, the ulcer base eventually heals. And this is reconstituted with normal gastric mucosa. All right. So you have a patient who's a poor surgical risk who said a cancer resected endoscopically without the patient having to undergo a gastrectomy, all right? So we now have uh, multiple studies uh, from uh, observational studies uh, that have looked at um, the outcomes of gastric endoscopic submucosal dissection. And what we now recognize is the overall survival from gastric ESD is comparable to a gastrectomy. All right, the, the, the main challenge with ESD is that we leave the stomach, which is which, um, behind. And this is a stomach that has um, demonstrated a propensity to develop cancer. And what that basically means is that the stomach may have uh, 
may be at risk of developing local recurrences. But thankfully, these recurrences are usually at a very early stage, either at a precancerous or early cancerous stage. All right, which basically means that so long as you survey these patients endoscopically, they may be amenable to endoscopic treatment in the event of a metachronous lesion. All right, so coming back to the stepwise uh, progression that we have just discussed. All right, so endoscopic imaging and intervention allows us to resect these dysplastic and early cancerous lesion, thereby preventing progression to an advanced cancer and death. All right, but then as I mentioned earlier, can you identify the patients who may be at risk of developing these uh, dysplastic or cancerous lesion? All right, so that they may be subjected to heightened surveillance. All right, and this is the, and in this regard, I think the the key um, lesion of interest is intestinal metaplasia. Intestinal metaplasia basically refers to the gastric epithelium being replaced by an intestinal type epithelium, typically in response to H. pylori infection. All right, the diagnosis is made based on gastric biopsies. All right, but now we can make a reasonably certain diagnosis of intestinal metaplasia based on the endoscopic appearance. All right, so if you look at the pictures at the bottom right, all right, this is what the scope looks like, the entrance looks like on, on endoscopy with NBI. All right, and you can make out all these same uh, patches over here, which is IM. And when, and when you close up, and when you look at it under high magnification, you can make out these faint lines here, all right, which are known as light blue crests, which are pattern mnemonic of intestinal metaplasia. All right. So why is intestinal metaplasia significant? As I mentioned earlier, there are several uh, precancerous lesions. Uh, this is a relatively old study from Europe, which actually looked at the rates of progression to cancer in patients with the various uh, intestinal, uh, with the various premalignant lesions. All right. And when you look at the second line from the bottom, this is IM. All right, so the risk of uh, cancer progression in intestinal metaplasia is actually pretty low. All right, the absolute risk is uh, less than 2% over a 10 year time frame. But once the patient has a dysplastic uh, lesion, then the risk of progression is actually much higher. All right, so <clears throat> intestinal metaplasia is now recognized as a risk factor for gastric cancer. All right, the problem with serving patients with gastric intestinal metaplasia is twofold. Okay, number one, the absolute risk of cancer is actually very low, as I've mentioned. You know, over a 10 year time frame, only 1.6% develop stomach cancer, which means that the majority of patients with intestinal metaplasia do not develop gastric cancer. All right. Number two, intestinal metaplasia is a very common finding on routine endoscopy. All right. If you look at studies done throughout the world, all right, up to a third of routine gastric biopsies actually demonstrates the presence of intestinal metaplasia. All right. So if you were to subject all of these patients uh, to surveillance, uh, then you know you have a problem because you're going to be doing a lot of unnecessary endoscopies in patients who are most likely not going to develop cancer. All right, so the challenge is in identifying high-risk subgroups within the population of intestinal metaplasia, all right, who may be at um, increased risk of developing stomach cancer. All right, and in this regard, I'd like to draw your attention to the Olgim staging. All right, so Olgim is basically a histological staging of the severity of intestinal metaplasia in the stomach, all right? So in a, it's an ascending scale from stage one to stage four, where stage four is the uh, most severe uh, degree of intestinal metaplasia, all right? So what we typically do is during endoscopy, we take mapping biopsies from the antrum, the incisure, and the body. And depending on the severity of intestinal metaplasia, as well as the extent of intestinal metaplasia, all right, that basically gives us the stage of intestinal metaplasia, all right? So this is a, Recent prospective multi-centered cohort study that was performed by our hospital uh, in conjunction with um, the other main hospitals in Singapore. And this was led by our colleagues at uh, National University Hospital. All right. And we had close to 3,000 subjects uh, who underwent gastroscopy with standardized biopsies. And they had scheduled surveillance endoscopies at year three and year five. And we looked at a combined outcome of high-grade dysplasia and adenocarcinoma, which was referred to as early gastric neoplasia. All right. And what was found in the study was that the stage of all game was associated with the risk of early gastric neoplasia. All right. So <clears throat> the risk was pretty low in patients with uh, all game one, which is the least severe um, stage of uh, intestinal metaplasia. All right. But once um, at higher risk, at higher stages of all game, all right, the risk of uh, early gastric neoplasia actually uh, rises substantially. All right. Such, such that in patients with all game stage three, stage four, uh, the risk is about 544 per 100,000 person years. All right, and this forms the basis of our recently published national guidelines for uh, endoscopic surveillance in patients with intestinal metaplasia. And broadly speaking, we look at two things. All right, we look at the, the all game stage, and we look, and the other thing that we look out for is the presence of uh, additional risk factors, namely smoking, H. pylori infection, uh, a first degree relative with gastric cancer, 
as well as the presence of a histological entity known as incomplete intestinal metaphasia. All right, and we stratify them broadly speaking into two groups, those with and without risk factors. All right, so those without the risk factors, we look at the all game stage. If it's all game stage one, no surveillance is needed. If it's all game two, we survey them at five years. If it's all game three and four, we survey them at three years. All right, and in patients with additional risk factors that I've just uh, highlighted, uh, the intervals are shortened. All right, and, and, and these are the um, uh, guidelines uh, promulgated by our professional society uh, uh, for for the endoscopic surveillance in patients with gastric free malignant lesions. All right. So <clears throat> this in summary is, is um, how we approach um, early gastric cancer. All right. We also recognize that while surveillance is helpful for the patient who is high M, um, the experience from other societies suggests that the vast majority of patients who are going to present with an early gastric cancer, all right, would probably occur in patients who are not actually part of the surveillance program. All right. And what that basically means is that we need to create greater awareness. Of, of, of people regarding every endoscopic, diagnostic endoscopic examination as an opportunity to identify early gastric cancer. And, and this is a work in progress where we are reaching out to our fellow endoscopists to train them, all right, in, in uh, techniques that would allow them to detect early gastric cancers better. All right, and this is uh, uh, a paradigm that has also found application in the esophagus, all right? And I'm just gonna just illustrate this very briefly. All right, this is a, a patient with a Barrett's esophagus and a, a, a cancer in, in a Barrett's esophagus segment. And <clears throat> instead of narrowband imaging, what we have done is that we have sprayed acetic acid, which is uh, vinegar, <clears throat> on the esophageal mucosa. So this white spot here that you see is, is the area that has been stained with acetic acid. And this is the normal Barrett's mucosa. And this is the unstained area, all right, which is the cancer. All right. And this is the corresponding view on NBI, all right, where you can basically make out the demarcation line as well as the abnormal irregular microvascular pattern. And this patient underwent endoscopic resection, uh, thus sparing the need for an esophagectomy. All right. And then a similar uh, um, paradigm has also taken hold in the squamous cell, uh, uh, in the squamous esophagus. All right. And this, is, and this is not a common condition in Singapore, but we do see it from time to time. Again, the patient underwent endoscopy for an unrelated indication. All right. And at a very faint area that, that could have quite easily been missed in the distal esophagus. All right. All right. But when you switch to NBI, all right, the black patch, the brown patch becomes a lot more evident. All right. And on closest scrutiny, you can actually make up the irregular microvascular patterns. All right. And then what we do is that we spray Lugol's iodine, which is an agent that allows us to uh, distinguish neoplastic areas from non neoplastic areas. All right. Because it stains the esophagus, but neoplastic areas are left relatively unstained. All right. And this is what you see. All right. This white, uh, yellow patch that you see here is a tumor. All right, and once you identify lesions like this, all right, it raises the prospect of endoscopic treatment, sparing the patient and esophagectomy. All right, so to conclude, all right, superficial GI cancers with no lymph node metastasis uh, may be treated with endoscopic resection. All right, and now there's a growing body of evidence to support endoscopic treatment as it has comparable long term outcomes to the corresponding surgery. All right, but ultimately, all of this is predicated on the identification of early neoplasia. Uh, which often requires the use of uh, advanced endoscopic imaging modalities. All right. And, it, and selected patients with at risk mucosa may potentially benefit from endoscopic surveillance. All right. And with that, I conclude. And I'll be happy to take your questions shortly. Thank you, Dr. Vikmason, for enlightening us on endoscopic surveillance of uh, early GI malignancies. In fact, uh, Jaffna is a hub of uh, upper GI malignancies, and we detect patients actually in a metastatic state. So it's very useful to us. The next speaker, the last speaker, is uh, Dr. Mahesh and Guru Paran, a well known to our all local audience. He is currently working as a consultant cardiologist teaching hospital Jaffna. He has received the gold medal for MD exams by Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Columbia in 2002. And his research interests are hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and heart failure. And he is going to enlighten us on is atherosclerosis inevitable? And can we stop, delay, or reverse it? Over to Dr. Guru Baran.
of all, let me thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. And also, I would like to thank Umanan for the kind words of introduction. My topic today is atherosclerosis. Is it inevitable? Can we stop, delay, or reverse it? Why atherosclerosis is such an important topic is because ischemic heart disease has remained the top cause of death for the last two decades. Not only it has remained the top cause, the largest increase in deaths, more than two million over the last two decades, has been noted with ischemic heart disease. Though a minority of them would be due to ischemic dilated cardiomyopathies, the majority of these deaths are due to acute coronary events. And we know that acute coronary events occur due to plaque rupture. And we now know there is plaque progression preceding the plaque rupture. So if we know how to handle the plaques, if we can prevent them, delay them, or reverse them, we might be able to succeed in overcoming the immense problem of acute coronary syndrome, uh, which, as the keynote speaker today mentioned, has a significant health economic burden in all over the world. I would like to start the lecture with two clinical vignettes. The patient one is a 38-year-old gentleman who has been previously asymptomatic, presenting with acute chest pain. The ECG shows extensive anterolateral ST elevation MI. He was thrombolyzed in a peripheral hospital and transferred to the cardiac unit, but despite the optimal treatment, dies on day five due to cardiogenic shock. The second vignette is a 76-year-old diabetic with multiple risk factors. He has been having class two angina for a long time, being managed medically, but coming recently with a rest angina, and the ECG shows ST depressions. He undergoes coronary angiogram, which shows trypsipia triple vessel disease, and uh, a successful CABG follows, and he is still asymptomatic 10 years post-surgery. These are the two extremes of patients that we see every day. We see young patients coming and dying without any risk factors, totally unexpected. Then we have patients who have multiple risk factors who, who do well with revascularization. But of course, we have a large gray area in between, but these are the two typical phenotypes that we see very often. We will see whether we can explain these clinical scenarios. So when does it all start? It starts very early. Uh, Post-mortem studies have shown that atherosclerosis may be there even in teenage and definitely in early 20s. Uh, by 30, most of us will have some degree of plaque deposition, fat deposition, and uh, over the age of 40, half of us will have cholesterol deposits. And after the age of 45, the plaque burden significantly increases. There is, of course, uh, good news for the ladies because the plaque progression starts later in them, uh, usually postmenopausally after the age of 55. There was an interesting study performed in US. Sorry. There was an interesting study performed in US which showed that over the age of 50 in men, about 85% of them had some form of atherosclerosis. So it was very widely prevalent, uh, but of course this was on an intravascular ultrasound. So if you have done a coronary angiogram, you wouldn't have detected them. But what is interesting is out of those 85% of patients over the age of 50 years, only about less than 10% of them were being treated for ischemic heart disease, meaning that in large number of us, uh, coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis is there, but it is totally asymptomatic and uh, is not being treated. But why is it that then some of these things happen? like the two clinical scenarios that we saw. That's because the atherosclerotic plaques go on to progress or grow over a period of time. We now know atherosclerotic plaques progress due to endothelial and interelastic lamina being non-functional. Uh, if you concentrate here, you will see that there is a vascular endothelium which has become more permeable to the LDL molecules and also there are monocytes which invade the intima. The LDL molecules get oxidized, and the monocytes engulf these oxidized LDL molecules, and they become larger, producing form cells. 
At the same time, the internal elastic lamina becomes uh, disrupted. The smooth muscle cells enter the internal lamina in intima of the endothelium, and they start proliferating. So the form cells become larger and larger, and at one point they rupture, releasing the lipid pool into the extracellular matrix. And there is also smooth muscle proliferation. Over a period of time, there can be neovascularization, new vessel formation, leading to intraplaque hemorrhage, and there can be calcification as well. So as long as the atherosclerotic plaque remains like this, it's not a major issue. But as they grow, they become problematic. And uh, as this video shows, there is a thin fibrous cap which uh, separates the lipid pool from the lumen. And it is the point when the, this fibrous cap ruptures or becomes uh, open that the lipid pool gets exposed to the bloodstream, uh, which is thrombogenic, and the thrombus forms, leading to either total or subtotal occlusion of the coronary artery and the acute coronary event. Looking at the stages of the atherosclerotic process, uh, the earliest mode, the fast, earliest change that we see is the initial lesion, which is only it consists of macrophages and form cells. But as they progress, there is uh, intracellular lipid uh, accumulation, and in type 3 intermediate lesions, we will see extracellular lipid pools. In type 4, there is a fibrous, type 5, there is a fibrous layer which separates the lipid pool from the lumen, and then we have the complicated lesion which has ruptured, forming the thrombus. There are multiple factors which predispose to this growth or plaque progression. We have obesity, uh, diabetes, there are genetic variants like genetic traits, gender of course plays a role, and age also contributes. Lifestyle changes like smoking, diet, lack of exercise can predispose to this atherosclerotic plaque progression, and uh, general conditions like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, homocysteinemia will also contribute. And uh, we now know inflammation also plays a major role in plaque progression. So atherosclerosis itself is not an issue. It is very highly prevalent. But when the atherosclerotic plaques start progressing, they become uh, troublesome. We now know the plaque progression occurs in a stepwise fashion. The traditional view was that plaques progress over time with age, and it is sort of inevitable. But, but now we know the plaque progression occurs during periods of growth, followed by periods of quiescence. So it has given us an opportunity to arrest this plaque progression during the period of quiescence and prevent further growth. As to how plaque progression happens, is uh, there is a fibrous cap, thin cap fibrous atheroma, which ruptures, and there is a clot formation. And over a period of time, the clot organizes, and then there is re-endothelialization. This is what happens when plaque ruptures. And uh, invariably, every time plaque ruptures, there is plaque growth. Because whenever there is a plaque rupture, there are more smooth muscle cells coming in, more lymphocytes come in, there is more extracellular material deposited. So with plaque rupture and healing, there is plaque progression or plaque growth. And that is how uh, this plaque progression happens in a stepwise manner. Every time the plaque ruptures, it grows. And then it is followed by a period of quiescence and then again there is plaque growth. Plaque progression uh, is considered uh, a, a key factor in plaque rupture. Initially, originally people thought it is the acute coronary syndrome, at least the majority of them were due to minor plaque rupture. As this uh, article showed in 1995, if you look at that, of those patients who had come with acute coronary syndromes, about 85% of them had minor plaques, that is meaning they had stenosis of less than 70%. But now we know prior to plaque rupture, the plaque rapidly grows, and uh, it is not totally true to say it is only the minor plaques that rupture. Not all plaques will progress over a period of time. The studies with intravascular ultrasound has shown only about 20% of the plaques grow over a period of one year. And of those who grow, which grow also, only about 20% will rupture within the coming 12 months. So this has given us an opportunity to identify and prevent plaque progression and plaque rupture 
thereby reducing the coronary events. Not every plaque will rupture. So there are features that are in the plaque that will indicate high risk of plaque rupture. Uh, the large plaque burden, thin cap fiber atheromas, the fibrous cup that separates the uh, lipid pool from the lumen being very thin, low attenuation on coronary CT angiogram, positive vessel remodeling. These are some of the features that will increase the risk of plaque rupture. The plaques that are likely to rupture are called the vulnerable plaques. Uh, if you look at the histology of a typical vulnerable plaque, uh, you will see a small lumen, large lipid pool. Uh, the fibrous cap will be very thin. Uh, it can be measured by intravascular ultrasound, and it, that will be less than 65 micrometers. There may be macrophages within that fibrous cap. There can be spotty calcification and intraplaque hemorrhage, and also positive remodeling uh, with uh, new vascularization. These are the features of a plaque that is likely to rupture, which is called the vulnerable plaque. There is a place for inflammation in plaque progression, and uh, we know that pa patients who have high sensitive CRP, high levels of high sensitive CRP, have increased atherosclerosis and increased risk of plaque rupture and acute coronary syndrome. Uh, conversely, it has been shown that by anti-inflammatory medications, we can reduce this atherosclerotic disease and acute coronary syndromes. We very well know that acute infections are associated with inflammation, but we also know that diabetes mellitus, obesity, emotional stress, even sleep deprivation can cause inflammatory state, predisposing to uh, atherosclerosis and acute coronary syndrome. Then another important point that we should keep in mind is that plaque disruption, either plaque rupture or erosion, doesn't always cause acute coronary syndrome. Uh, it has been shown that majority of the plaque ruptures and erosion remain asymptomatic. Uh, this was highlighted in a study where they did postmortem, uh, extensively uh, sharp postmortem on coronary arteries on patients who died of non-coronary causes, and they found that somewhere between 15 to 30 percent of those patients who had died of a non-coronary event had plaque rupture or erosion in post-mortem studies. That is to say, if you take the audience here and if you find more than 50 years of age, uh, one in three of us may be having a plaque rupture at this given moment. That, does, that is not very frightening because most of these plaque ruptures will heal spontaneously, and it is uh, only about a minority of them will give rise to uh, acute coronary syndrome. So the question arises, why? Why is it that some plaques will heal and some plaques will not, will not heal and give rise to the acute coronary syndrome? It has been also been noted that the degree of underlying coronary plaque stenosis corresponds to the degree of number of, uh, the number of plaque disruptions. Of those minor lesions, only about 15 percent 15 had evidence of plaque disruption, but as the stenotic increases, stenosis increases, as they become more and more stenotic, there were more disruptions and heal processes visualized in those plaques. Uh, this also further supports the idea that plaque grows by disruption and healing. So if you look at the picture here, that is the thin fiber cap atheroma, it can either undergo plaque rupture or plaque erosion. Uh, leading to a intra intraluminal thrombus formation. Uh, they say in the event of acute coronary syndrome, this is the first hit, that is the plaque rupture or plaque erosion. It can go on one of the two ways. It can, the, the thrombus can progress to cause an acute coronary syndrome uh, where there is failed healing, which is considered the second hit. In patients who have effective healing, the, the atherosclerotic plaque will heal, of course, leading to more coronary stenosis because we know when there is healing, there is plaque progression, the plaque grows, causing more significant stenosis. So this is what happens in, in atherosclerosis. When the plaque ruptures or erodes, it can either lead to a thrombus, a large thrombus causing total or subtotal occlusion and acute coronary syndrome, or it can heal, but at the expense of further narrowing of the lumen. So we, I think we have some answers to the 
questions that we had. A patient one who had a, probably a non-obstructive lesion, uh, maybe 40, 50 percent, which ruptured, forming a thrombus, and uh, there was poor healing, and uh, ended up having an extensive anterior ST elevation MI. On the other hand, a 76-year-old man probably had extensive atherosclerotic burden, had multiple plaque ruptures and erosion, but successfully healed, uh, leading to further narrowing of the lumen, and uh, the lumen came to a critical level where it was ischemic, and he was revascularized and had successful uh, surgery. These are the two extremes. That doesn't mean that every patient will fall into one of the two groups. We have a mixture of those two. Uh, we can have somebody who has been having stable angina, has had successful healing, but for some reason, uh, his healing process was impaired and then coming suddenly with an uh, extensive myocardial infarction. Uh, I was just trying to highlight the two extreme possibilities because this is something that we see and that is, uh, has been a problem for us uh, in finding what the real causes are. Uh, plaque healing. So ha can we promote plaque healing? There is, uh, there is not enough knowledge as to why some people heal well and some people don't heal well. Uh, there are multiple therapies that have been tried out. Uh, Lipid-lowering diet, lipid-lowering drugs have been tried out. There have also been trials with anti-inflammatory drugs like interleukin-1b and uh, CD31 targeting therapies, things like that. But uh, I think what is available for us at the moment uh, is the suggestion for lipid-lowering diet and lipid-lowering drugs. Now we come to the question of can we reverse plaques, atherosclerotic plaques, which is called plaque regression. Traditionally, we have noticed that when we do angiograms repeatedly on a patient, sometimes that is required, uh, we see a plaque which was originally higher at percentage or stenotic level, which has become less. Uh, so that has been a surrogate marker of plaque regression. What we are looking at actually when we talk about plaque regression is the total atheroma volume being reduced. That may itself be not be very clear in traditional coronary angiography, but we have more advanced technologies, more advanced ways of invasive and non-invasive ways of looking at atherosclerotic plaques and assessing their sizes. And now we know it is possible to make them regress. Uh, it is not only a plaque size reduction, but there is also concern whether we should consider plaque morphology change as plaque regression. Because if we can convert an unfavorable plaque, which is vulnerable, which is more likely to rupture, into a plaque which is less likely to rupture, should we also consider that as plaque regression? Uh, the answer is usually considered as yes. How do we look at the plaques? There are different methods, but the, the gold standard, or what has been, we have been practicing, is the coronary angiography. But that has been superseded by more uh, better, high resolution uh, imaging techniques, both invasive and non invasive. We have intravascular ultrasound scan, optical coherence tomography, coronary CT angiogram, and PET scans. Uh, some of them have very high resolution, and they can accurately measure the uh, 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 fibroatheroma cap to the level of micrometers. Uh, they also can assess the plaque volume and, to some extent, plaque composition, whether they are rich in fibrous tissue, rich in lipids, whether there is calcification or not. Plaque regression uh, is possible by one of three ways. Either we can reduce the cholesterol deposition using lipid-lowering drugs, reduce cholesterol inflammation by anti-inflammatory drugs, or we can make the endothelial repair more efficient by form of exercise. So there have been treatment targeting plaque reg reg regression either by dietary and lifestyle changes and by pharmacological methods. Can we actually change our diet and make the plaque smaller? Uh, the data is very, very limited. There have been few trials. Uh, the Onish Chattel published in 1998 that there is uh, less coronary progression at five years when you convert to a vegetarian diet in addition to stopping smoking and uh, aerobic training and et cetera, et cetera. The Disco City trial, again another trial which uh, showed greater reduction in non-calcified plaque volumes uh, by being uh, adhered to a hypertension nutrition model type of diet. 
but overall, most dietary arms of potential undergoing uh, uh, patients, uh, most patients on dietary arms did not show a significant reduction in atheroma volume. And uh, as of now, the evidence that we have is very limited to advise uh, that alone as a way of treating for plaque regression. Exercise, uh, can it matter? Does it matter? Can we exercise and reduce the plaque size? Uh, there have been two randomized trials which showed that uh, plaque regressed in the exercise arm, but uh, these were not only involving exercise, but uh, they were involving other lifestyle changes as well. And uh, there was a one trial where there was a post-hoc analysis which showed that patients who walked more than 7,000 steps per day had greater plaque regression compared to people who walked less than 7,000 7, steps. Uh, there were other observational studies which included body mass index and smoking cessation in addition to exercise which showed a favorable atheroma size. So therefore, all together, when you put all these together, it, you, it, it is reasonable to say uh, we should promote exercise as offering modest benefits in plaque regression. Smoking, we know current and former smoking is a major risk factor for coronary artery disease. We know that uh, patients who smoked had a higher necrotic volume, the coronary plaque burden was higher, uh, uh, and. Uh, Therefore, they are at a higher risk of plaque progression, plaque rupture. Uh, but at, however, smoking cessation as a way of plaque regression, uh, we still don't have enough evidence to support that. It is the same for alcohol. Uh, though alcohol is considered a risk factor, we haven't been able to find uh, uh, any studies to show that alcohol restriction will cause plaque regression. Statins are the mainstay of treatment for plaque regression. We know it works by inhibiting the HMG reductase. It reduces the LDLC cholesterol by 30 to 50 percent. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, the atherosclerotic heart disease prognosis depends on the extent to which we reduce the LDLC cholesterol. Uh, the impact of statins on plaque regression has been well studied, and uh, they have noted 0 to 20 percent plaque regression in patients who have been start treated with intensive statin uh, drugs compared to a 10% progression in the control group. Uh, this chart, chart shows uh, the number of studies that have been performed, and uh, uh, here is the plaque volume reduction, and this is the LDL level which was achieved. Uh, you can see that most of the studies have achieved a LDL level of less than 100, and in some, it has been as low as uh, 45, mm. to 45 to 50. Uh, and uh, most of these studies have shown plaque regression, uh, varying from 0%, meaning that there was no progression, uh, to up to maybe 20%. These two studies, the Gleglow study and the Odyssey IVA study, were performed using PCSK9 inhibitors, which are a potent lipid-lowering drugs. Uh, that was why it was possible to reduce the cholesterol, LDL cholesterol level to less than 40. But uh, as you can notice, the benefit on plaque regression is not as good as with statins. Asteroid study is the uh, landmark study which used rosuvastatin 40 milligram uh, on patients uh, and studied over a period of 24 months using intravascular ultrasound scan and they demonstrated a 6.1% reduction in atheroma volume. And there were other observational studies like the HOSMA study and the IB study, which also demonstrated similar results. What is the impact of diabetes? The PREDICT trial compared patients on statin with and without diabetes on plaque regression, and they found that patients with diabetes have less plaque regression compared to patients who did not have diabetes. Uh, this. Uh, uh, results showed that the effectiveness of statin therapy at achieving plaque regression may be blunted by other comorbidities. What is the dose of statin that they have used? Yes, the reversal study compared atovastatin 80 milligram to pervastatin 40 milligram and found that the higher dose of atovastatin 80 was superior in causing plaque regression. The same was seen in Saturn study where they used rosuvastatin 40 against atovastatin 80. Uh, this is to be expected because we know that the 
to the level, the, the lower the level we reduce the LDL cholesterol, the higher the benefit in terms of plaque regression. Do statins change plaque composition? We looked at the uh, plaque regression and said it is not only the volume reduction, but also the change in composition, making the plaque from unfavorable to favorable plaque or less vulnerable plaque for rupture should also be considered as plaque regression. We now know the statins also uh, change the plaque composition in a favorable way. They increase the fibrous volume, fibrous thickness, which makes them less vulnerable, and they make it more calcified. And they also reduce the fibro fatty volume, necrotic core, and non-calcified plaque volumes. So they have a impact on total atheroma volume, as well as they change the plaques to a more favorable one and less vulnerable for plaque rupture. STMIMIP has been in use for some time, and uh, multiple studies have shown benefit in reducing cardiovascular events when combined with statins. Uh, there have been at, at least six randomized trials looking at the plaque regression, and they have found that when you add STMIMIP to statins, they have a minor uh, advantage in the sense that there is plaque reg regression which is more than statins alone, but the impact has been small. PCSK9 inhibitors are very potent lipid-lowering drugs. Uh, we looked at the two trials, the GLAGLO and the Odyssey IVA studies, which had shown that the LDLs can be reduced to a very low levels, to less than 50 milligram deciliter, but the benefit on plaque regression has been minimal compared to statins. Uh, uh, giving rise to uh, uh, the hypothesis that statins may be acting in multiple ways in addition to reducing LDL cholesterol. Plaque regression, does it make a difference? Uh, can plaque regression uh, translate into clinical benefits? Yes. For each 1% reduction in percent atheroma volume, they have found there is a 20% reduction in major cardiac adverse events. So though we, when we looked at the graph, we were not very happy seeing 5, 10% reduction in atheroma volume instead of seeing 40, 50%. Even 1% reduction in atheroma volume was, will significantly reduce the major, major cardiac adverse events. So what is the future and where are we heading? Originally in the 1980s, we were concerned about the stenotic lesions. We did angiograms, we looked at the stenosis, 80%, 90%. We wanted to stent it. We thought that was the end of the problem. But then came the concept of vulnerable plaque, where people said it is not only the 70-80% plaques, but even the 40-50% plaques can rupture and cause a myocardial infarction. And just dealing the tight stenosis alone may not be sufficient. Then came the concept, no, it is not the tight or the vulnerable plaque. You have to look at the ischemia level. You should be able to demonstrate ischemia before you deal with a lesion. Uh, then came the concept of inflammation, and we tried multiple anti-inflammatory drugs to treat atherosclerosis. Then people thought it is not only the plaque, but the patient has to be concerned, because uh, when we talk of plaque rupture and healing, the healing may be influenced by multiple factors, which are systemic rather than local. And therefore, we started treating the patients with statins and antiplatelets and kind of things. Then as the technology advanced, we were looking at lesions with FFR, fractional flow rate, and assessing whether the lesion that we think is 80% is actually causing limited flow, whether it needs addressing or not. Then subsequently, we gave up all, thing, all these and said, the clinical risk of acute coronary syndrome depends on the total atheroma burden. Uh, like if somebody has an 80% stenosis in a right coronary artery, compared to a person who has multiple lesions of 50 to 60 percent, the person with multiple lesions is at a higher risk of acute coronary syndrome than the person who has a critical right coronary lesion. The traditional way we would have dealt with the right coronary artery with a critical lesion with a stent and ignored the other patient as having minor coronary disease. So this was refuted and they said the higher the atheroma total burden a person has, puts him at a higher risk of acute coronary events. Therefore, you should treat the patient uh, equally aggressively compared to a patient who has single or one or two multiple tight stenosis. Then came and currently accepted theory is that it is a 
a combination of three factors, a prothrombotic milieu, uh, atheroma burden, and the disease activity, uh, all should be considered. So the ischemic heart disease treatment is transforming. We were lesion focused initially, now we are becoming patient centered. We were keen on revascularization, both stenting and bypass, but we are now concerned more on early detection and prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuruparan, for enlightening the audience about the burdens of atherosclerosis and the importance of lifestyle modification, diet, exercise, smoking cessation, as well as the importance of statin therapy to reduce or delay the burden of atherosclerosis. The symposium is open for questions. Uh, audience uh, who joined online can um, put their questions on the chat box and who are present here, please come to the stadium and ask the question on the mic, please. For the microphone. Sorry, we don't have a guest. Yes, uh, uh, I think it is. Uh, there is enough evidence to say that Southeast Asians are at a higher risk of coronary artery disease compared to the Caucasians, and the risk is even more when we migrate and adapt to their lifestyle. So, Southeast Asians are best advised to stay in their countries <laughs> if they want to prevent it. So, so we are in an era where we are considering diabetes is quite reversible. At least it's practically possible, no, might not be clinically relevant. Same thing I'm looking uh, at atherosclerosis regression is we, we haven't proven practically possible. The reason perhaps maybe is it like we have only focused on one confounding factor in a very shorter period. So had it been as we the teaching or the, the Scandinavian study shows, if it's hypertension is controlled, diabetes is controlled, pressure is controlled, cholesterol is controlled, lifestyle changes is done, and for a longer period, then I probably, probably we might think, okay, regression is possible, and then it will lead to CKD to be <laughs> reversible as well. Yes, so atherosclerosis starts very early. They say even in teenage, it has uh, been found in post-mortem studies. And uh, it has also been found that of all the patients who had atherosclerosis as a teenager, may not progress to have significant disease. Uh, so there are traditional uh, known risk factors for atherosclerosis, uh, which some of which are modifiable. But uh, the, our problem has been that we still don't know a large number of risk factors which are causing this atherosclerosis. So there are unknown risk factors because uh, we very commonly see patients with young patients coming with uh, ischemic heart disease uh, without a significant risk factor at all, uh, except maybe being the Asian population, the genetic predisposition. Uh, other than that, we can't find any risk factors, but they come at very young age with severe atherosclerotic disease. So yes, if we know the risk factors, we can modify them and we can reduce but uh, 
I can't see uh, that happening in the foreseeable future because there is a large number of uh, diseases, the risk factors which we haven't yet identified. And uh, the projections have been that we will have a significantly more ischemic heart disease in future. Uh, the, 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 the difference from the number one and number two is going to be even wider as time goes. Uh, but my hope is also, <laughs> as yours, we will be able to do something. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Darante and uh, Dr. Vigneshwaran and Dr. Guruparan on highlighting three different problems relevant to our part of the country. Uh, of course, I'm a physician, so I will ask questions from Dr. Guruparan. Uh, my question is, uh, now as you discussed about two different patients, the category of the young patients where we see uh, almost daily one or two patients coming in early 30s or 40s, uh, coming with extensive uh, MI or some cardiac problem. And uh, of course, we manage them from the time of admission. And uh, these patients are around us all the time until they come with this devastating problem. So is there any way that we can detect them early or catch them early and uh, start on the appropriate lifestyle modification as well as the statin therapy uh, so that this burden can be reduced? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think that is a problem. Uh, the only available screening that we can do in these patients uh, is the coronary CT angiogram uh, because most of these patients will have non-significant stenosis, meaning less than 70% stenosis. So any stress test that we do on them, like uh, exercise ECG or stress echo, will not give any clue. Uh, so the only test that has been recommended uh, for screening this kind of patients is the coronary CT angiogram, but that comes with added risk of radiation and the exorbitant cost that is uh, that would be involved if we start screening these patients because these are patients who are otherwise healthy who don't fall into a high risk group. So I don't think we can totally do that. I mean, screen everybody and uh, identify coronary, early coronary artery disease, maybe 30, 40% plaques, and put them on a strict diet, exercise, and statins. Uh, but that has been the challenge, and that is why uh, ischemic heart disease is still the number one leading cause of death. Uh, even US or well-developed countries uh, uh, don't uh, even think of doing that because the, uh, when you do a cost-benefit analysis, uh, that will be failing us. So I think most of the guidelines, most of the recommendations uh, from the committees, uh, they don't look at only the benefit, they also look at the cost. Uh, and that's why most of these uh, cannot be practiced. Uh, but uh, if, if for a personal reason, if somebody wants to know whether I have got any disease, atherosclerotic plaque now, I'm totally asymptomatic, I'm free of any risk factors, but I want to know, the only test that is being free available now is the CT, uh, coronary CT angiogram. And uh, at a personal, you can get it done, and then it will give you an idea whether you need to be on intensive uh, lifestyle changes and drugs. That will definitely help if that is the case. of uh, the questions. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Tay, Dr. Vigneshwaran, and Dr. Guruparan for the interesting topics enlighten us of uh, the Symposium 1 and shall we wind up Symposium 1 with this. Thank you.
the dignitaries for sharing the profound knowledge with us. We request Professor T. Kumaran and Dr. Mrs. J. Pradeepan to honor the resource person with a certificate of appreciation. We humbly request Dr. M. Guruparan to receive the certificate. Certificate of Appreciation for Dr. Vikneswaran Namasivayam and Professor Darante, who joined virtually, will be sent through the post. We invite Vice Chancellor Professor S. Sri Satkunaraja to honor the chairpersons of the session with the Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you, sir. And with that, we shall wind up the first symposium. We thank the chairpersons and resource persons for their valuable contributions today. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's the time for a break. I would like to request all our guests to move towards the conference hall. We will resume here at 1.30. Thank you. Zoom 